you all to this portfolio committee held on the virtual uh, platform. Uh, the president has outlined the six term government priorities, which among others is to build a capable, ethical and developmental state. Today's agenda item for the committee is to hold the Department of Public Service and the, the Public Service Commission accountable on activities undertaken to curb corruption in the public service. A war against corruption can be defeated if government begins to fix its in-house measures. Uh, intended to prohibit public servants from doing business with the state. Laws have been put in place. What is required now is implementation and effective monitoring. With those few words, the purpose of today's meeting is to receive presentations from the Department of Public Service and Administration and the Public Service Commission on the following. Implementation of government employee housing scheme, prohibition of public servants from doing business with the state and the enforcement of the law, financial disclosure framework and its linkage to prohibiting public servants from doing business with the state. Without any further waste of time, let me allow the, the deputy minister to provide us with uh, her opening address, and then the chairperson of the commission will also provide opening address before the acting DG presents. But before honorable minister, you take the platform, can, can I get the, the apologies for today's meeting because they should be recorded if there are any. Are there any apologies uh, Mastrone, for today? Thank you, sir. Uh, the only apology we have, sir, is an uh, apology from Honorable Komane, who is not able to attend today. Uh, thank you, okay. sir. Thank you very much. Can I invite the Honorable Deputy Minister to take the platform and make her opening address? Thank you very much, Chairperson. Uh, honorable members of the Portfolio Committee, our Director General, uh, Ms. Yoli Swamakasi and Senior Management of the Dep Department of Public Service and Administration, the Chair of the Public Service Commission, Advocate Sizani, and other commissioners that have joined us in management of PSC. First, Chairperson, let me indeed extend the apology from the Minister of Public Service and Administration. Uh, he is attending the Cabinet Committee on governance and we have an item to present as the department and therefore he had to be present at that meeting. However, I'm here representing both myself and the minister. As you have indicated, Chairperson, it is true, one of the priorities of the sixth administration is building a capable ethical and a developmental state. And in building that capable state, we want to have professionals who are serving people with empathy in accordance with the constitution of the Republic, the Batupili principles and the public service chart. A capable public service also means having qualified people who know what they are doing and are fully equipped to perform their jobs with diligence and in compliance with all prescripts of government for efficient public service. A capable state might also mean having public servants who are responsible and are accountable for their actions, omissions, and commissions. Many public servants are hardworking, they are honest, they are competent, they are committed and accountable. But unfortunately, some have been seduced by greed and succumbed to corruption and have become unresponsive and unaccountable. To address these challenges of corruption and lack of accountability, government has implemented a number of interventions to monitor and enforce compliance among public servants. For instance, 
the public service regulations of 2016 are one of the legislative frameworks that provide for a prohibition, prohibition on public service employees conducting business with an organ of state. Regulation 13C states, and I quote it, an employee shall not conduct business with any organ of state or be a director of a public or private company conducting business with an organ of state unless such employee is an official is in an official capacity a director of a company listed in schedule two and three of the public finance management act unquote in our quest to have a professional ethical and accountable public servants the department of public service and administration developed a number of directives to support the implementation of regulation 13. today we will be receiving a comprehensive report on the employees that have been found to be conducting business with the state and the progress made to eliminate such behavior. I am however pleased to report to this meeting that part of the outcomes of the report that will be presented here include some decrease on the number of cases of public servants doing business with the state since the criminalization of such behavior. The decrease in the number of cases could be attributed Chairperson, to the collaboration between the Department of Public Service and Administration, SAPS, Department of Justice and NPA, and the level of awareness raised among public servants due to media reports on this collaboration, especially after the portfolio committee meeting held towards the end of 2020. Mm -hmm. This communicates to us that we are doing something right to ensure we manage state resources and are guarding against abuse and misuse of state resources. Honorable members will also know that our public servants are faced with challenges of owning homes, just like the majority of South Africans. We have said this over and over again. Then the establishment of government uh, employees housing scheme aimed to ensure that our public servants own quality homes that are affordable. The department has since inception of this resolution, which is resolution seven of 2015 of PSCPC, created a ring fenced funded project management office additional to the DPSA establishment to implement the resolution. However, the uneven progress since the resolution prompted the relook at the scheme and approach in 2020 and the Ministry of Public Service and Administration approved a new strategy for the implementation of the scheme. In addressing this, the department has institutionalized functions of the, of the scheme within the approved structure of the, of, of, of the department. The reviewed strategy approach takes into consideration the successes, including lessons learned, challenges the scheme encountered, and challenges that have been registered by beneficiaries in terms of accessing the benefits of the scheme. So honorable members, we are looking into everything about the scheme at this moment, and a lot of work is happening within the department. Our presentation in this meeting will therefore provide a detailed progress report on the established partnerships and collaboration they have currently, they, we have currently, to improve the services of the scheme, as well as to ensure it renders a professional and satisfactory service to public servants as intended. The presentation will provide clarity on the existing benefits and the requirements that members should comply with to access those benefits. Honorable members, at this moment, I will hand over to the chair or whoever is leading the PSC to make the presentation as per the request of the chairperson. Mm -hmm. And following that, the DG will make the presentation, will lead the presentation for the Department of Public Service and Administration. Thank you, Chairperson. Can, 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 can uh, the chairperson make uh, his uh, opening address as well? Chairperson of the Commission. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chairperson. 
Minister and Honorable Members. Uh, I am Mike Silwan. I am the convener of the Integrity and Anti-Corruption Specialist Team in the Public Service Commission. So the chairperson has delegated me to come and make presentation together with the DDG, who is responsible for integrity and anti-corruption. That is DDG uh, Matume Malazi, who is uh, uh, in the meeting. Uh, let me just start by indicating that uh, our role as a commission is to, amongst others, promote a high standard of public, uh, a high standard of professional ethics in the public service. And amongst those is to uh, uh, manage uh, issues of conflict of interest in the financial disclosure framework. So public service regulation uh, give us the responsibility to receive disclosures from senior management service, that means from director upwards. of interest. And if uh, the PSC is of the opinion that there will exist a conflict of interest in the disclosures that have been sent, we then advise the minister through a letter uh, where there will be recommendations or advice on what actions that should be taken to minimize or remove the conflict of interest at all. And the conflict of interest, it may be a, a, an actual one or a potential one. And that's uh, uh, what we do as far as uh, uh, the, the, the financial disclosure framework is concerned. So on an annual basis, we develop an overview of all the departments, how they uh, uh, submit and uh, their performance on submission and scrutinize the forms. Uh, from all those senior managers who are about 10,000 of them. Uh, it's just, uh, uh, it is important at this, no, uh, at this point to indicate that only about 15 officials are responsible for scrutinizing uh, all these uh, disclosure forms from senior managers, which are about 10,000. So the capacity sometimes uh, is an issue. So the portfolio committee requested us to make a presentation on officials who conduct business with organs of state. Now, uh, from our presentation that we make, which comes from the overview on financial disclosure framework of senior managers, it will indicate issues of conflict of interest, including some of the officials who are conducting business with the state. And through this report, uh, or, or this uh, piece of work that we're doing. Uh, we see ourselves as uh, uh, playing a meaningful uh, role or a bigger role in terms of uh, uh, discussions or proposals. Okay, sorry proposals. for interruption, uh, Mr. Sloan. Can you put on your, your, your video? Because uh, the, the proceedings of the portfolio committee are recorded and kept in the archives of parliament. So the speakers, as they speak, they must put on their videos. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. I wonder if... Oh, 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 it shows another. Do want the rocks? We want your picture. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm still trying. <laughs> uh, mm. uh, Just press that video. Um, yeah, that's what? what I did. So, so. I um, don't know now how to issue. do this. Hi, it's a settings issue. It's a settings, <laughs> yes. I'm trying to get to the settings. Uh, my apologies. Uh, I'm not sure. Okay. 
okay, okay, okay. Oh, Continue, but uh, whoever is going to speak thereafter must put on the video. Continue now because this, this is a big problem of the settings. Uh, Chair, my apologies. Uh, uh, this uh, an issue with the settings. Uh, I will do. I, I will do that uh, at some stage. Uh, maybe let me just continue and then allow the DDG uh, to uh, to take the portfolio committee through, and then I will work on my settings. So, yeah, I, what, it's okay. Chair, what what I was indicating is that. Uh, through the work on financial disclosure framework, we are then able to uh, touch on those officials at senior management level who are engaged in uh, conducting business with the state. So the scrutiny will reveal uh, those uh, officials. And then I will allow the DDG uh, to take uh, the portfolio committee through uh, uh, the details of the presentation. And then in that process, I will look at the settings. Uh, DDG Malaz, you can come in. Thank you, Commissioner. Good morning, uh, Honorable Chairperson and members of your committee. Good morning, uh, DM and the DG of the Public Service uh, Administration. Let me continue with the presentation. Um, I would request that whoever has rights, please uh, give them to Commissioner Sloani so that they can share the presentation we are going to talk about. Um, we have circulated uh, to the committee the presentation, and we have tabled the report that relates to this presentation. And I hope that uh, members do have these documents that I'm talking about. Allow me, uh, Chairperson, not to repeat what the uh, Commissioner Sloan had already uh, talked to. My name is Matumi Malaji. I'm the Deputy Director General Integrity and Anti-Corruption in the Public Service Commission. Um, the mandate of the PSC overall is to promote values and principles enshrined in uh, section 195 of the constitution uh, to investigate, monitor, and evaluate the organization and administration and personnel practices of the public service, propose measures to ensure effective and efficient performance within the public service, we do give directions aimed at ensuring personnel procedures relating to recruitment. We also investigate and evaluate application of personnel and public administration practices. Then thereafter, we report to the relevant um, uh, EA, the relevant authority. As Commissioner has alluded, we have been requested to present uh, to this August committee uh, the issue of the financial disclosure framework with uh, particular emphasis of those officials who were found to be doing business with the, with the, with the state. Let's move up one slide. Um, because all of what is on the screen now has been shared by, by Commissioner Sloan. Um, the Commissioner, move up the slides.
Yes, this is the slide that we want to share with you, uh, uh, honorable members. We are reflecting the compliance with uh, regulation 18 and 19 of the public service regulation relating to disclosures, which requires that by the 31st of May, uh, SMS members shall have disclosed the, the uh, 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 their financial interest in their department and their departments will release all of that to the Public Service Commission. So we indicate here that as at 31st May of 2020, the PSC is 98% of the expected um, 10,032 financial forms. We indicate that this is a one percentage point increase in the submission rate as compared to uh, the previous year, 2018-2019. Uh, Despite this increase, uh, the submission rate recorded in respect of the current reporting period is still one percentage point less when we compare it to the 2016-2017 financial year. So here we are just depicting the, the, the uh, a compliance rate over a period of uh, five years. We will move now. There is a table that we'll share with you to, in the next slide. This table indicates per national department, government components, provincial departments, um, the, the, the compliance rate who disclosed as at the due date of 31st May, 2020, who disclosed after the due date and who did not disclose at all. So this is the table that relates to, 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 the, to the disclosures compliance rate, as well as those that did not disclose at all. If you look at the second last column, you will see there is 169 uh, uh, at the SMS level uh, in the public service who did not uh, disclose at all. And it's, it is in this regard that we, we advise the EAs to take the appropriate steps uh, against officials who who are not uh, complying with the law because as the as the government were required to 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 comply with the law with the laws of the republic the next slide we are going to at a high level indicate um, the forms that we received what did they consist of um we say 9753 SMS members um, who were in the system disclosed their registrable interest during that period as required by uh, Regulation 18.1. So they complied. Members should note that compliance does not necessarily mean or translate into disclosure of accurate financial interest. Because after this, there's gonna be a scrutiny that we conduct where we, we evaluate whether people have disclosed accurately uh, issues that they need to disclose and there are no, no contradictions. We do that by comparing the disclosed information and, and data uh, from third party uh, institutions that are working with us in this regard like the Deeds Registry, CIPS, ENATIS. Uh, 15 SMS members were appointed after 1 April 2020 and disclosed their financial interest during the month of May 2020. Um, 95 SMS members who were already in the system prior to 1 April 2020 but only disclose their financial interest during the month of May. So here we are detailing um, of those who have disclosed, how did it happen? There is a 2% of forms that were still outstanding as at the 
due date of 31st May 2020. And we attribute this to the state security agency whose uh, forms were not submitted at all. We can uh, in, uh, uh, report to this committee that we engaged with the state security agency and they undertook to, to submit these forms to the PSC. However, that did not happen. Uh, and members would know that um, this emanate from that issue of saying uh, they operate with confidential uh, staff and they thought they could not, uh, they, they are not required to disclose. But in terms of the law uh, and the research that we did, members of the state security agency are required to disclose their interest. And the, we, we, we had plans in place to, to enable them to disclose, you know, working together with the inspector general. Apart from the SSA, there are also other SMS members, uh, including five director generals and four heads of departments whose forms were not submitted to the PSC as at the due date of 31st May, 2020. We emphasize this point because it's a compliance point. It's required by uh, the regulations. Uh, and these are the accounting officers. They must lead by example. Although you will see in the next slide that they, they have submitted to their uh, uh, executive authorities, but there was a delay there in releasing the information to the Public Service Commission, either because the minister was new or the ethics officer was new and um, and did not advise the EA on time, uh, reminding them to, to release the forms to the PSC. In other instances, the EAs would say um, they, they are conducting verification themselves before releasing the forms because they don't want just to release and only to find that there are issues which they, they, they were not uh, aware of. But we always, Upon receipt and after scrutiny, we advise them accordingly what are the findings and which steps they need to take. So we are saying here they need not waste time trying to verify uh, because that is the, the assignment that is uh, given to us to assist them with. Um, the second slide continues to show, this is just those departments or the director generals whose forms um, were received later uh, after the due date. The next slide will show also the four HODs. Um, um, let's move up, Commissioner. Yes, here we, we show the, you would have seen that the, the, the HODs are also, indicated which departments uh, they, they, they belong to. Uh, so we will pass this, but just for you to note, we still have that issue of state security that is unresolved, but we keep uh, uh, following it up with the colleagues that side. Now, here is the findings uh, emanating from the scrutiny. The scrutiny is that as an exercise of, of checking what is on the disclosed on the form and what is available in the, in the third party databases. Uh, we say 21% of the SMS members who have interest in companies did not disclose their companies. And this is a contravention uh, to the regulation, uh, 19 of the public service regulation. 69% of the SMS uh, members who did not disclose their financial interest uh, in companies are repeat offenders. What the SS commissioner has alluded to, Whenever we come at this point, and these are our findings, we communicate them to the EA and request them to take the appropriate steps. The appropriate steps will include uh, 
calling the officials involved, asking them, giving them the, their side of the story to explain why is this the case, even after so many awareness has been raised about uh, the importance of disclosure that we want to manage a conflict of interest in the workplace, particularly at this level of, of management. Um, I'm going now uh, to show that one of the disclosed companies, uh, undisclosed companies, uh, is in Houghton Province uh, that was found to have conducted business with two organs of state, and we named them there. Uh, I didn't catch that. The national, Could you try again? The National Department of Education. Um, and, and also in the KZN. So the next slide talks to non-disclosure of immovable properties. We say a total of uh, 361, which con co consists of 4% of SMS members in, in the public service, did not disclose their ownership of immovable properties during 2019. 2020 financial year. Among these SMS members uh, who did not disclose their properties, we break them down there that uh, uh, two DGs in national departments and two HODs with one each in Limpopo and Pumalanga provinces. There is in total 19 SMS members who have repeatedly failed to disclose their ownership of immovable properties during the period under review. Now we move on to non-disclosure of motor vehicles, um, where we found that 8% of SMS members in the public service did not disclose their ownership of motor vehicles during 2019 and 20 financial year. Among the defaulting uh, SMS in this regard, we break it down there. We have four DGs uh, in the national department and 10 HODs in the provincial department. This is all data that is uh, available in our position, which um, is, uh, can be shared with as and when is required. Uh, because sometimes during uh, uh, corruption investigations, we are approached as the PSC to provide these details as to uh, non-disclosures, those assets that are not uh, were not disclosed, which um, often get found that um, they, 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 they can be regarded as gratification, um, so we have been assisting law enforcement agency uh, with, with 205, what we call 205. In other words, we give a, an affidavit and attest to what was disclosed and whether it was uh, legal or illegal. A total of 6% of the SMS members who did not disclose uh, the ownership of vehicles are repeat offenders. We are going to move on to the next slide. Uh, a potential conflict of interest. A commissioner has explained what this is. Um, uh, during the period under review, which is 2019-2020, uh, we have 1,508 SMS members who were involved in activities that could be construed as potential conflict of interest. For instance, uh, you'll have a, a SMS members a company uh, registered on the central uh, database. Uh, so in that case, at any given time, that person can be able to do business. So we say it's a potential conflict of interest. And we advise the EAs to, to call these people, talk to them and make sure that they know they cannot do business with the state. 
if they were to do business outside of the public service, they, they need to be authorized for remuneration outside the public service. Um, we, we say this accounted for 15% of all SMS members whose forms were scrutinized by the PSC. Here, I just need to indicate we have a compliance rate, meaning the people who submit the forms by a particular date. Then we have a scrutiny that we conduct. When we conduct a scrutiny, because we have data of who is, in, who is appointed by government as the SMS members, we scrutinize all financial interest of all SMS members. So just to make that point clear, that we do scrutinize even the forms of those that uh, have not uh, uh, submitted their e-disclosures. We move actual conflict of interest is the, the example of the case that uh, I already pointed out where a person uh, uh, was contracting to national basic education and to a department in KZN. Um, and this is a matter of great concern because the, the conducting of business is now criminalized. And uh, that's the message all leaders have been conveying. We have been conveying as well. Uh, the minister has uh, uh, referred about 1,000, uh, uh, Minister Senzom Tunu, referred about 1,500 uh, officials to SAPS uh, for investigation and criminal prosecution in the past year. So it is a very serious issue, which we need um, EAs uh, uh, to, to, to internalize and make sure that in their departments, it doesn't happen. We move on to the next slide, Commissioner. We indicate here that 11 cases of actual conflict of interest were recorded in the public service uh, during the 2019-2020 financial year and we give a breakdown of what uh, where those uh, conflict of interest were identified. In the national departments, there was one case and 10 were recorded. Three provincial uh, departments, we, we, we indicate the, which ones are they, free state, housing, uh, two of whom are the HOD of human settlement and the former HOD of health in that province. Here we talk about Houghton province and the Northern Cape with one case involving an HOD, HOD of transport safety and um, liaison. Conducting business with an organ of state, this is what I just explained. It is outlawed, um, it's uh, criminalized in terms of uh, Regulation 13C of the Public Service Regulation and Section 82 of the PAMA Act 11 of 2014. Um, so, so this this is where criminal prosecution will, will, will take place with regards to identified officials. Uh, we move on to the next slide, engagement in, in other remunerative work. Uh, the scrutiny revealed that 4% uh, of the SMS members in the public service were engaged in other remunerative work during the period under review. Uh, 199 of these SMS members, members which this constitute a 52%, provided proof that they obtained prior permission to do so in terms of section 30 of the act. Um, and the issue here, even if there is proof obtained, we must guard against abuse of state resources, uh, assets for 
private interest. Uh, like fax, telephone, email, you find the person is, is conducting that, that business which has been authorized, but now using um, state uh, assets. The EAs were advised to take appropriate steps in terms of Section 31 of the Act. This is where the Act says they must uh, uh, follow the matter up, uh, discipline the, 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 those that are not uh, authorized, uh, and, and even recover and pay into revenue an amount equal to that of, of any such remuneration. We are going to move up uh, the slide. Um, now we talk about receipt of gifts and sponsorship from sources other than family members. So here yeah, the scrutiny of the 2019-2020 revealed that uh, the combined value of gifts that were received in 2019-2020 financial year uh, came to about 4 million uh, 600,000. Um, and it was less um, from the one that of the preceding year, which was uh, 8 million. Um, the issue with gifts, this is where um, corruption is hidden. You undertake a trip to, to Mauritius paid by a service provider uh, and not disclose it. That is gratification. Uh, if it's a service provider in your department or elsewhere, then you need to disclose it and the circumstances under which uh, it was it happened. It's uh, some of the investigations by law enforcement uh, relates to, to, to such trips undertaken and sponsored, which uh, uh, in the final analysis at that point, it comes out that there was a gratification because this is the service provider that is rendering business in that HOD or senior manager's uh, department. So we collaborate with law enforcement as and when such information is required and we depose the necessary affidavits to make sure that these people uh, do not get away with it. There are SMS members who disclosed uh, departmental gifts uh, and so on when they attend conferences and, and, and um, seminars. Receipt of gifts, sponsorship, uh, we, we have passed this, we can pass this slide, Commissioner. Next slide. Um, Compliance with the requirement uh, to take actions and report back to the public service on the details of the actions taken. So every time we advise the EAs and we indicate under these circumstances, the EA is required to, 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 to institute disciplinary action or to consult with officials. We do uh, um, expect feedback uh, which is, it is uh, uh, provided, but not all the EAs do provide feedback. We indicate here that EAs were satisfied uh, with the responses given by some 260 of their SMS members during the consultation process, because that's what the regulations say. A total of 164 SMS members who did not disclose registrable interest and those with potential conflict of interest were sensitized of the need to comply with the regulations and to avoid conflict of interest. And this will be included in the feedback as it comes to the, back to the PSC. Disciplinary actions were taken against 82 SMS members who contravened the provisions of the financial disclosures framework. 
Um, again, here, the, the outcomes, most sanctions is written warnings, final written warnings, um, according to the information in our records. Recommendations. We say relevant EAs must act decisively against this HODs, DGs who do not comply with the framework in order to engage, uh, to engender the culture of compliance from the top. But as, as alluded, I indicate that the DGs and those HODs pointed to had their form submitted to the EAs, but EAs delayed in releasing them to the PSC. Repeat offenders must be dealt with more harshly when actions are taken against them. Ethics officers must periodically consult the central database, uh, central supplier database of the National Treasury to check if companies linked to SMS members in their department uh, uh, and first are not doing business, but secondly, that there are no such companies, because once you go and put it there, your intention can only be one, to conduct business. And at the time the business is awarded, nobody is, 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 um, is um, um, alert to that, um, to that uh, activity. So, so we discourage that SMS members have their companies registered on central supplier database. In case of actual conflict of interest, EAs must initiate investigations for purposes of disciplinary inquiry in terms of the directive on conducting business with organs of state, which was issued by the Minister for Public Service and Administration in January 2017. Where appropriate criminal case must be opened with the South African Police Service against the affected SMS members in terms of Section 83 of PAMA. Let's move on, Commissioner. Um, we are almost concluding, Chairperson. Um, next slide. In case of cases of non-compliance with Section 30 of the Public Service Act, uh, the EAs must invoke the provisions of Section 31. I already explained this one. Uh, this is where this other remunerative work that is conducted outside the public service. The PSC is of the view that the Minister for the Public Service and Administration must, we must continue to issue guidelines detailing which of the sponsorships may not be disclosed for purposes of the financial disclosure framework. This is things like uh, conference uh, 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 packages and so on, because that's what most uh, SMS members would disclose. EAs must, within 30 days of receipt of the PSC report, at least acknowledge receipt of the PSC report and provide an indication on how the recommendations will be dealt with. Uh, this one, we take it up with ethics officers, with chief of staffs, just to say, don't sit with documents and not even say, we have received the uh, report from PSC, we are actioning it, then we'll revert to you once uh, we, are, we are done with actioning it. And I think this, this was the, the next one is the last slide. There is slight improvement overall in compliance with the requirements to submit financial disclosure forms. It's how, however, it is disconcerting that full disclosure of the registrable interest is still, is still a, a, an issue. We don't have full disclosure, like we pointed cars, immovable properties that were not uh, uh, disclosed. Um, the challenge, um, the ability is the ability to manage comp uh, this poses a challenge to manage conflict of interest in the public service if there are there are registrable interests that have not been uh, disclosed and this is also compounded by the involvement of some of the hod's in the perpetuation of non-compliance with the regulatory framework 
the EAs need to strengthen their resolve in enforcing full compliance with the regulatory provision under all circumstances and to dealing decisively with defaulting HODs. This would help in setting the tone from the top. Uh, in conclusion, that was the conclusion, Chairperson. We want to thank you for this uh, opportunity. Honorable Chairperson, that's our presentation. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, Chairperson, let me just indicate that, uh, unfortunately, I logged in through the link of Parliament and I didn't uh, directly zoom in. So that's why I was unable to uh, set the video on. So my apologies. Okay, okay. Thank you. Uh, honorable members, because we have a sitting this afternoon, I think we must get the, the next presentation and then we discuss these presentations together. In the interest of time, this is a proposal I'm making. I think it's the correct proposal according to me, Honorable Chairperson. I agree with you. Thank okay. you. Thank you, thank you, Honorable Mtipe. Is there any dissenting view? No, sir. None. None. Thank you very much. Can we get the next uh, presentation by the department? Thank you, Chairperson. With your permission, uh, this is the Director General, Yoli Samaka, of the department. I'm going to request that um, the, the, the head for the Technical Advisory Unit um, Mr. Solomon, uh, Dr. Solomon, please take over and present on the on the uh, employees conducting business with the state and some of the interventions that we have put in place as the department. Over to you, Chairperson. I do need to highlight, Chairperson, though that I think that we are experiencing similar challenges with uh, director generals in terms of or heads of departments in terms of really holding employees accountable those uh, who are found to be conducting business with the state and um, moving with the disciplinary processes within the departments. And um, Minister has uh, indicated as part of the interventions, I think that in March, early in March, he will be addressing Foresight where there'll be DGs from national as well as provincial departments, HODs as part of dealing with these particular matters, but it's still remaining a challenge for us, um, that particular issue. Over to you, Solomon. Thank you, Chair. Um, Thank you, Solomon. Come in. Thank you, um, Honourable Chair. Morning, Honourable Chair, Ministers, Deputy Ministers, Committee Members, DGs and um, colleagues. I've been asked to um, prepare a briefing on um, public servants conducting business with the state and the number of officials imprisoned as per the public service regulations. Now, my presentation will um, cover introduction, interventions, the status as at 31st of January this year, investigations and the way forward. Now, since January 2017, the DPSA has been monitoring the implementation of Regulation 13 and also regulation of eight or section eight of the Public Administration Management Act, which not only prohibits public service employees from conducting business with the state, but also criminalizes um, public service employees, um, advisors and public administration employees from conducting business with the state. Now, since then, numerous letters were directed to departments the portfolio committee was briefed on the um, yearly increase of employees identified to be possibly conducting business with the state and the departments who did not investigate cases, we've handed a list to the portfolio committee. Now, since 2017, we observed a steady increase in the um, names of public service employees 
um, listed on the central supplier database. Central supply database plays the role where you need to register on this database before you can do business with the state. So when your name is flagged on this, it means that you have the intention to do business with the state. So in 2017, we found that there were 518 pub 80 public service employees on the list. It increased 2018 to 679. In 2019, it increased to 1,068, and 2020, it increased to 1,539. But as the Deputy Minister indicated this morning, in 2021, January, we found that there's only 484 public service employees listed on the CSD, and they are possibly conducting business with the state, possibly because they may have been appointed in an official capacity, some of them, and some may also have resigned and that the names still reflect on partial um, and therefore they flagged or that the um, departments um, appointed them under a wrong code, that they're actually not public service employees. So um, that is why we um, address, to address the list of um, 1,539 employees. We have um, drafted a template and we sent it on the 30th of June, 2020 to the 28 national departments and all the offices of premiers who had employees listed on that list so that we can sanitize the list to see who are the people that were wrongfully um, flagged or those who already resigned or those who, are, who were um, acting in an official capacity. And we requested feedback by the 15th of July, 2020. Now we received feedback um, from the following departments um, on the screen, basic education, employment and labor, environmental affairs, forestry and fisheries, government communication and digital technologies, health, office of the chief justice, office of the public service commission, science and technology, the South African police service at the later stage, who they first requested um, extension, and then the statistics, South Africa, tourism, trade industry, and competition. Now, the following national departments did not respond. Agriculture, land reform and rural development, cooperative governance, correctional services, higher education and training, home affairs, human settlements, international relations and cooperation. We also received responses from the following provincial departments. In KwaZulu-Natal, we got um, feedback from the agriculture and rural development, arts and culture, community safety and liaison, cooperative governance and traditional affairs, education, human settlements, office of the premier, public works, social development, sport and recreation, transport. The Western Cape, we uh, received feedback from agriculture, department of the premier, education, health and provincial treasury. Northern Cape, we got feedback from cooperative governance, human settlements and traditional affairs, health, office of the premier, social development, sport, arts and culture, transport, safety and liaison. Now, based on the um, fact that we received slow um, uh, trickle of information from the departments, Minister Nkunu, um, the Minister for the Public Service and um, Administration, on the 22nd of July, 2020, invited the Minister of Police and the Minister of Correctional Services to have a meeting where they decided that uh, there's a need to establish a multi-departmental team coordinated by the G DGs of the respective ministries to ensure that the allegations regarding employees possibly conducting business with the state are investigated and that those who are found guilty are prosecuted. So the 24th of August, the DGs of the multi-departmental team met and approved an MOU, which clearly highlighted the roles and responsibilities of each department. And this was accompanied by a multidisciplinary plan of action, focusing on 10 priority cases and on dealing with a list of the employees um, identified in 2020 to be possibly conducting business with the state. So in terms of the MOU, the DPSA will identify the employees registered on the central supply database as per our mandate, and we will be assisted by the National Treasury in doing so. But because the DPSA cannot um, discipline employees from other departments, it is up to the departments to investigate and then to discipline their employees. 
and then to report criminality to the SAPs, where the SAPs will then investigate the cases. And where they find that there's enough evidence, they will hand it to the NPA to prosecute. Now, um, the SAPs was then provided with a list of all the 1,539 public service employees who's, who were possibly conducting business with the state. And on the 4th of September, they started with a process to um, clear the, the individuals on the list. And they identified 579 individuals on this list that may be um, conducting business with the state. On the screen, you will see the um, breakdown of that number, 579, of which uh, 157 of national departments, and then the rest in the respective um, provinces. Now, to assist the departments who receive letters of employees possibly conducting um, business with the state, the DPSA arranged two training sessions, in, uh, virtual training sessions, one in August and one in September last year, where all those ethics officers who had employees in their departments possibly conducting business with the state and investigators of those departments were invited and they were trained by the SAT on how to investigate employees conducting business with the state. So on the 15th of December, 2020, the DPSA then um, forwarded follow-up letters to the departments listed by SAPS and requested feedback by the 23rd of December, 2020. We received um, confirmation from those who already confirmed in June, and then the, the other departments also responded, like the National Department of Public Works and Infrastructure, and then the following provincial departments from Limpopo, Health, Economic Development, Environment and Tourism, Agriculture and Rural Development and Education. So if, Chairperson, if we look at the status on the CSD and we compare that to last year, um, January or um, uh, March 2020, we found that there's a decline from 2020 um, to 484 in 2021 which is still less than this 579 identified by SAPS in September last year. So it looks like there is a, a decline in the um, number of public servants who, um, I, who uh, registered themselves on the CSD to be able to conduct business with the state. Now, the national departments, in uh, um, 2020, we had 29 national departments with employees possibly conducting business with the state. That dropped to 17. The provincial departments, we had 13 in um, 2020 in Kuzulu Natal. That is now seven. And um, it means that there's eight um, Kuzulu Natal departments who have no employees conducting business with the state, which is an increase of one. From, laws from 2020. Gauteng, we found it decreased from 11 to 7 of employees conducting business with the state, and um, meaning that there is now seven departments who have no employees conducting business with the state, which were in 2020 only three. Now, Northwest, we've also found a decline to two. Eastern Cape, a decline to 10. Limpopo, a decline to four. Mpumalanga, a decline to seven. Free State, Northern Cape, and the Western Cape, all a decline. So it clearly indicates that uh, um, the provinces we had in the past, a serious problem with um, employees conducting business with the state, are also experiencing a decrease in public servants um, registering on the CSD. Now, uh, Honorable Chair, if we come to the issue of investigations, one must remember we started the investigations in September last year, so it's a six month period. Um, so most of the cases are still being investigated, not only by departments, but also those who um, the departments forwarded to SAPS. Um, if we look at the SAPS investigations, they are um, uh, hard at work to investigate the SAPS employees who had been identified in the process. And on 28th of October, they indicated in a report to the DPSA that they identified 78 employees to be conducting business with the state. 
with 49 of them being active directors of companies registered on the CSD, 19 being inactive or resigned directors, and 10 whose identity numbers they um, could not see recognized on the SIPC. So the, they indicated that the disciplinary processes were at different um, stages, that they have seven criminal cases and one criminal inquiry registered against SAPS members. And this included um, of the 10 priority cases that were given to SAPS um, by the, um, interdiscipline, the interdisciplinary team. Um, seven of the cases of the 10 priority cases, they have been um, already started with work. Now, on the 21st of January, SAPS indicated that they are still investigating one case, which the DPSA um, uh, forwarded to the SAPS for investigation upon receiving it from the Department of Science and Innovation of a possible case where an individual um, uh, conducted business with the state. SAPS also indicated that they have nine cases um, still involving SAPS members, of which one case involved um, four SAPS officials. Now, Honorable Chair, if we look at all the investigations from a departmental perspective, which the departments actually are the first point of entry, if they do not investigate the cases, SAPS cannot investigate because they must um, investigate and then find the um, uh, uh, um, evidence for um, conducting business with the state and hand it to the um, SAPS for further investigation. So out of the 484 cases identified, national departments investigated 83 cases already that they started with, and 42 cases were not investigated. Provinces started with the investigation of 94 cases, investigated 94 cases, and 264 are still outstanding. If we look at the no responses that we received, um, 46 departments indicated the no response or gave us no response. Five national departments, we'll see agriculture, land reform, rural development, higher education, training, justice and constitutional development, correctional services and water and sanitation. And 41 provincial departments did not give us a response. Um, that is now uh, the one in health, KwaZulu-Natal, Gauteng, we had the community safety, economic development, education, health, human settlements, provincial treasury, roads and transport, who did not give us any response. In terms of Northwest, um, the education and sports development and health did not um, give a response. The Eastern Cape, it was a cooperative governance and traditional affairs, education, health, office of the premier, provincial treasury, roads and public works, rural development and agrarian reform, social development, sport, recreation, arts and culture, and transport. Limpopo, the following two, social development and then cooperative governance, human settlements and traditional affairs. In Kumalanga, it's agriculture, rural development, land and environmental affairs, community safety, security and liaison, cooperative governance and traditional affairs, culture, sport and recreation, education, health, public works, roads and transport. The Free State, it's education, health, police roads and transport, provincial treasury, social development. And then Northern Cape, it was agriculture, land reform and rural development, education, um, economic development and tourism, provincial treasury, roads and public uh, works. And then for the Western Cape, it was culture, cultural affairs and sport, economic development and tourism. Now, um, the departments who commenced with investigations, who indicated to us that they commenced with investigations, it's 17, of which six is national departments, the Department of Basic Education, Environmental Affairs, Forestry and Fishery, SAPS, Tourism, Public Works and Infrastructure, and Trade Industry and Infrastructure. The 11 provincial departments is KwaZulu-Natal, um, um, Agriculture and Rural Development, Brazilian Natal Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs, Brazilian Natal Education, Brazilian Natal Office of the Premier, Brazilian Natal Transport, Lim uh, and then Limpopo Education, Northern Cape Cooperative Governance, Human Settlements and Traditional Affairs, Northern Cape Health, Northern Cape Social Development, Western Cape Education, and Western Cape um, Health. 
So the cases that um, were indicated to us to be finalized and where employees were found guilty um, is one, National Department Employment and Labor. Now, um, the ca cases finalized and not found um, guilty was four, were four national departments, DPME, Science and Technology, Social Development and SAPS. And cases referred for disciplinary hearing Two national departments, SAPS and Social Development, and one provincial department, the Northern Cape Health. Criminal charges, that's one national department that um, had criminal charges, SAPS, and then also one provincial department with Boko Health, which indicated they referred cases to SAPS for investigation and for criminal charges. So, um, Honorable Chair, this brings me to the conclusion where. Um, I can assure you that the DPSA is continuously following up with departments who's not investigating the cases. We also provide technical assistance for those who require such. We are um, also supported by the police, by two specific brigadiers who um, provide technical assistance to the departments who um, require that assistance to investigate the cases. The DPSA is also in constant liaison with SAPS regarding the referred cases. And um, I would humbly make a, a plea that SAPS be invited to present on the progress regarding the referred cases, because it's not in the purview of the DPSA to present on those cases. And then, as indicated by the DG in the beginning of the session, the Minister for Public Service and Administration indicated that he's going to have a special for SAP in March where this matter will be addressed with all the departments who's not responding in our investigation, um, investigating their cases to be present at the meeting. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, honorable members, the, both presentations are now open for discussion. Can I, get members who want to speak to show their hands on the platform. I see Honorable Soma, your hand is already up. Honorable Trebekulu. Uh, Honorable Schreiber, in that order. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my apology, I won't show face because I've got a difficulty with connectivity here at the village. But I'll just show it for one second to follow your instruction. There's me peeping there. That's me, Honorable Chair. Thank you very much. Let me just switch it off my video with your permission. Chair, probably one must uh, start with appreciating and uh, a slight excitement from the day last year, if all of us, you recall, Chairperson, that we did engage on this matter where we requested a detailed uh, a, a report in terms of who and how much and, and uh, at what stage are those issues in terms of investigating. And, uh, and then uh, we were hoping, but in a, in a, in a, in a way, Chair, both DPSA and uh, uh, PSC have covered that in terms of uh, which, like, for a better way, I would say name and shame. But also, I would request that if, uh, if they can go back to the slides that they gave us last year and also give us a status specifically per, per, per province, per department, per individual in terms of senior management, and how far specifically are those cases? Because our template that we, we would like to see the progress would be based on that and whether also, are there any additional offenders, as it were, which undermine the, the, the laws of public services, as it were? But I, I'm saying one is um, encouraged that the department, in particular, Honorable Minister, is following this thing up to the team. But the, the other one, Chair, that I would like to make a comment to take home by the DM, it's whereby the officials, they allege that they've been instructed by whether political or whoever, that's one. Two, also what I would like also the investigation when it's done on a specific matter 
It does a follow up where officials do um, a, a business with the state, but not in their department, such as in other provinces or other uh, uh, departments, whether there is no trade offs of officials in, in that space as well, because uh, uh, it, it, it would be defeating the, 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 the intention if there is still that uh, trade offs that are being done. If they are, I'm not saying they are because I don't have evidence, I can't make that allegations, but I think it's a space that needs to be looked at. Uh, Chair, in terms of DPA, uh, 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 PSC, I I've had that they are saying that the EAs, in some instances, they might not upload the information to the portal that indicates whether they've uh, cleared that, they've satisfied, they sign it off the declaration of financial interest of an individual uh, 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 senior management as it were. But also for me, I think the system that needs to be developed, both DPSA and DPM uh, and Public Service Commission is that which would be able the system automatically to ensure that to reflect that a individual have submitted, but because of the changes of the new EA or whatever, but is able then to, for, for that particular official to be seen having complied than to wait for the EAs. But also, I don't know whether the DM will take it home to say, I fail to understand as uh, uh, Commissioner Sloan have said that they are the ones who can cross check why the departments want to do the double job. Is it a, a, a lower level of confidence to the Public Service Commission? I don't think it's an intended one, but it seems slightly to suggest that. Hence, I'm saying that they must just say, how do they smooth that process so that also there's a better appreciation from both parties, which then a, a public service commission then can do the latter part a, a, as it were, so that the picture can improve. The other one, Chair, just has have some notes here, you'll forgive me. Okay, I've spoken to Okay, I've spoken to this. Uh, the name and shame has spoken to that. Uh, I'm not too sure, but I'll just slightly also go into uh, DPSA. If the department may also for the benefit, if, if they, they have said that, but uh, I'll just ask the question, I might have omitted that in terms of the listening, that can they clarify on cases where public servants were found to be conducting business with the state, however, were found not to be guilty? Are there such instances? But what would be the cost for them to zeronate them from that? Maybe the department provided clarity on that one. Such and for an example, there was the uh, with DPM, if I'm not mistaken, and science and technology. With regards to the configuration of the system, which I've uh, partially spoken to, is to say that of the system, how, how far in terms of the configuration of the system, how far is that process thus far? particularly with the departments that are not in the system, because last time when you, you report to us, there were some uh, departments that were not in the system. And I believe that is mandatory for all the departments to be in the system so that automatically we are able to use so-called the dashboard to monitor the progress thereof. The very last one, Chair, one would be happy that uh, probably in the near future when they come back to us, they don't give us a round figure, but they break those figures specifical to provinces and to departments, and also how much has been recuperated uh, in that process of making sure that we stop and make sure that we lead by example in terms of those culprits or serial offenders as it were. With that, Chair, thank you very much for the opportunity. And I think the department is in the right pace. Even the ethics uh, unit also will do a very good job in terms of cleaning the system. Hopefully by end of this term, we would have made a mark. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Ngozi Tadekulu. Chairperson. Chairperson, thank you for the opportunity. And thanks for the presentations uh, from the, uh, the commission as well as the department. Uh, Chairperson, uh, one would uh, like to point out, you know, this is a, if I could call, it's a, a big uh, elephant in the, in, in the room to stop uh, employees of the state doing business with the state because people have many uh, 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 ways of 
by passing the, 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 the system that has been put in place by the department. You know, Chairperson, um, what one has been exposed to is the fact that, you know, in, 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 in some instances, you find that uh, the officials or the employees of the state use relatives, companies, and they, as they are, or they are doing fronting uh, with their relatives' companies into getting access to do, doing business with, with, with the state, which I, 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 I find might be very difficult for the department to, to sort of uh, 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 stop it. The tap is on when it comes to uh, 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 dealing with these issues, Chairperson. Uh, this uh, is, is a comment that I'm trying to make uh, with regards to uh, the challenges the department, uh, the state is facing with regards to employees doing business uh, with the state. Although they know it's uh, 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 not acceptable and not allowed uh, by law. Chairperson, I was just uh, looking at, uh, listen to the presentations. One thing I have uh, identified in, 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 the, in the area, in the report of, of, of the KZN, where they were sort, sort of saying um, uh, they don't uh, include uh, traditional leaders, which is using Duna in Amakosi as part of uh, the employees of the state. And what one uh, sees in the rest of the provinces where there are they, they, they are departments of, 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 of uh, traditional affairs. Not uh, all of them have come up except for the KZN. Thirdly, the unwillingness of some of the departments in different provinces not to cooperate. Uh, this gives a, 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 a what are called? This gives a, 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 a challenge when uh, you see that uh, some uh, provinces, provincial departments, don't simply give what is expected of them. I'll, I'll, I'll say that they simply pretend as though they, they, they don't give a damn on, 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 on working cooperatively with uh, the, the, the PSC as well as the department. And what is the department doing to sort of uh, throw those departments to do as they are expected? Uh, 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 in order to sort of uh, expose those uh, 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 employees who are not uh, being uh, who are not being cooperative and abide by what the department are, are expecting, that was just my take, chapters. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll just stop there. Honorable Schreiber. Thank you, Chair. Good morning. Good morning to the colleagues and good morning to the officials. Uh, Chair, I have a couple of concerns, but first of all, I do want to thank the officials for the work that has been going uh, into this. Uh, I do appreciate that the DPSA is not in a position to actually uh, get convictions or, or even uh, force some of these departments to respond. Having said that, I think that the failure by, I think it was five departments to to respond to the templates that are sent out, even when uh, there's reminders sent out by letters, that is certainly a serious issue. And I think the appeal should go here to the deputy minister um, that this is a, a place where some political unclogging might be necessary, where the minister or the, D or the DM can please step in and make sure that the leaders of these departments who are not responding understand that it's not optional that this is a legal requirement that, uh, and the DPSA is trying to get this information from them. Chair, I think the other big concern for me is, however, uh, the conviction rate, if you wanna, if you wanna use that term. And I refer to either people found guilty in disciplinary processes or indeed the SAPS investigations uh, that were referenced during the presentation. I think that if I understood it correctly, there was, there's only been one criminal conviction uh, out of all these cases that have been, or potential cases that have been identified. I'd like to echo the question from the Honorable Lesoma about what are the reasons for uh, such a low conversion rate, that's perhaps the better word, of suspected cases into disciplinary action and criminal convictions. And I think we must, um, we must follow up on the suggestion to get SAPs, uh, Chairperson, to, to present to us and 
give us some more detail on what the issue is there, because it sounds to me like a lot of the evidence or the information that would be required to follow up through investigations or criminal investigations are actually uh, already available. They are collected, they are collated by the department. So we need to understand what exactly is the holdup uh, that's, that's causing this low conversion rate. Um, I'd like to ask the officials uh, if there is anything they can tell us about why there is that low conversion rate from uh, suspected or identified cases into disciplinary action and criminal convictions, keeping in mind perhaps that the DPSA does have a stronger hand to play when it comes to the disciplinary cases, if not the criminal convictions. Thank you, Chair. Honorable Gondwe. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Um, I have questions for the PSC, uh, uh, the Public Service Commission and the DPSA. Um, with regards to the presentation by the PSC, um, they indicate that 2% of the outstanding forms as at 31 May are attributable to the SSA. And because the financial disclosure forms from all the SSA members were not submitted at all. Now I want to know, um, and then in the course of the presentation, um, there was an explanation given that they did engage them and they undertook to submit these forms, but this is, did not happen. And I, 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 I tend to echo the sentiments of, of Honorable Shriver that perhaps there needs to be some political involvement in the sense that um, the ministers need to, you know, to, to, to flag these issues with one another. Um, to my knowledge, having sat on, on, on the, the Joint Standing Committee on Intelligence, um, these disclosures pertain to um, the individual. And, and I don't know if, if, unless they're trying to say that they're holding, um, you know, uh, assets in, in, in their official capacity, but um, I don't know how that would compromise the operations of the SSA. So this is very concerning that you have um, departments such as the SSA who, uh, you know, are, are not submitting at all because they're under the impression that given the nature of their work, et cetera. And, and 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 I and I'm worried that this this you know this this will only cover up whatever is is going wrong you know, um, and then um, you indicate as well in the presentation that 20, 21 percent of SMS members with interest in companies did not uh, disclose uh, uh, um, their companies. Please elaborate. Are you trying to say that? Um, they failed to disclose that they had interest in the companies or they just failed to disclose the names of the companies that they have interests in. And then you also indicate that 11% um, of SMS members who did not disclose their interest in companies are repeat offenders. Was there any action initially taken against these uh, uh, repeat offenders when they initially initially you know, committed this offense of not uh, uh, disclosing their interest in companies? Um, because you know, people repeat an offense if they know that there are no repercussions and you know there are no consequences. Um, uh, and and it, it worries me that you know uh, you have these uh, uh, repeat offenders, and all we can do at this stage is is identify them, and no action is being taken against them. And you know that speaks to the fact that perhaps you know um, they know that there will be no sanction meted out, uh, you know, if they continue, uh, you know, committing you know this this offense. And then you said EAs are failing to provide feedback on actions taken. And you indicate in the presentation that 30 out of the 146 EAs um, provided feedback and you're constantly inundated with requests for extensions. Do you then grant these requests for extensions? Um, I mean, I mean, or, I mean, do, how do you determine whether or not to grant an extension? Because I don't think granting these extensions um, it will solve matters and it will only uh, perpetuate this culture of non-compliance that, 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 you know, we, we are seeing. And then um, in the recommendations, you know, it's all and well to share recommendations uh, with us, but are you sharing these recommendations, um, you know, with the EAs and, and, and the particular, you know, the, the relevant ministers to say that we've got a problem in your department, you know, we're not getting this information, these disclosure forms. And, and, um, and I don't know whether a solution would be actually to attach um, 
you know, the, 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 you know, the, the submission or the, or the successful investigations of instances that are flagged uh, to, to the performance agreements of these EAs, because I don't know how we're going to ensure that, you know, there is strict compliance, because at this stage, um, you know, we are still having, a, a, you know, a, a considerable number of employees that are just not complying, you know, for, for whatever reason. And so I'm a bit worried. And then um, the framework, the financial disclosure framework, how often is it uh, reviewed? Because I'm worried that uh, because it's not being re reviewed as often as it should be, you know, it's just a framework on paper and it doesn't have teeth. Of course, there's an improvement. I'm not taking away from the fact that there's an improvement, but I'm still worried that we still have instances where EAs are just not, uh, you know, at, uh, considering this to be an important part of, 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 of of having a professional and ethical, uh, you know, uh, public service. So I'm, I'm a bit worried about that. And then um, the DPSA, um, let me applaud you for the interventions that you've put in place, especially that interdependental inter team that you've put together with yourselves and, and, and justice and the conclusion of the MOU by, by the relevant DGs. I'm, over, I'm a bit concerned that the ethics officers that were trained um, only uh, uh, received training from SAPS. Why were they not trained by the NPA? Because the NPA is the one that ultimately has to prosecute these cases once SAPS has finalized the investigations. And so um, it's very important. And I think that, um, you know, the ethics officers also receive um, training from the NPA. And then um, DPSA, there's a discrepancy between the figure that you came up with and the one that SAPS came up with, which is 500 and uh, 79 and you came out 484 uh, and but you were both uh, you know you both identified these individuals from the same database so I'm a bit concerned that there is this discrepancy although it's not very wide but there is this um and how does it work I mean um I mean I, I'm, I wasn't entirely sure uh, why there was this, this this discrepancy and I want to get an indication that out of the 484 I just need a holistic number out of the 484 cases that have been identified, how many are currently being investigated? And when I did my calculations, it was actually 265 that are outstanding. So I'm not entirely sure, and not 264. So if you could clarify that. I appreciate that the DPSA is in continuous communication with all the departments, not investigating their cases and providing technical support uh, where it's, it's required. Are you giving them deadlines? Um, around, uh, you know, submissions and, 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 and not necessarily submissions, but around uh, when the, you know, the, the investigations have, have to be finalized. Because, you know, we already have a problem of, 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 of disciplinary cases that are just outstanding in, in the public service. And I'm just worried that they're just, they're never ending and there's no conclusion to these disciplinary investigations. And as Honorable Shriver pointed out, you know, we've yet to get, uh, you know, a successful prosecution. It's just people being criminally charged. But until such a time that people are, are, are actually prosecuted and, and, and convicted and, 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 and thrown into prison, I don't think anybody's going to take this uh, seriously. Um, I agree that SAPS has to be called in, uh, you know, and give uh, the committee an update on, on the cases that uh, have been referred to it for further uh, investigation, as I indicated, until um, you know there's a successful uh, you know prosecution and conviction, I don't think very much would would change. And um, and perhaps when SAPS comes in, we 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 find out whether there's a dedicated team that that deals with this issue. Perhaps that could also um, you know speed up um, the you know the investigations around uh, uh, around 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 this issue. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Thank you, Honourable Maluleke. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Let me join honorable members who welcome to the presentation. I think it was a well- Can you put on your video, honorable Maluleg? Chairperson, I will just, so that you can see me now, but I, I have a problem with my network. Can I just switch it off, please? Chairperson, um, Firstly, I would like to commend the departments for encouraging uh, officials or the public servants in their department to submit their financial disclosure forms. But I'm not too happy with the 98% submission. I think this is a compulsory requirement 
of public servants to submit their disclosure forms. And 100% submission is expected. So I, I just hope that uh, public uh, PSC will have to engage with departments to ensure that public servants, they comply with this requirement. Can PSC recommend to DPSA to come up with measures to ensure that all officials or public servants do comply on this requirement? And my second question would be, or maybe it's just a comment, can PSC tell the committee about the successful cases of using financial disclosure forms to prohibit public servants doing business with state and keeping corruption. If they can just share with us the good stories or successful cases that they have uh, identified. And lastly, Chairperson, the, D, the PSC, when they are analyzing their financial, their financial disclosure forms from public servants, what does the PSC do when officials are disclosing as directors of companies in their financial disclosure forms? What is it that they are doing if the public servant is indicating that is a director in that uh, in of a company in the in their financial disclosure forms? And secondly, does the system used to ver to verify public servants' profiles able to do to determine whether officials, companies have conducted business with the state because we can say they must comply and we analyze those disclosure forms, but what is it uh, that we want to get after analyzing the, the, those disclosure forms? Does the system have an indication of whether these companies are doing business with a uh, state or what is it that is there when they analyze the, the disclosure forms. Chairperson, for now, thank you very much. I think some of the questions that I wanted to raise were raised by my honorable members who spoke before me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Honorable BC. Honorable Smith, it's your turn now. Okay, thank you, Chairperson. Chair. You can continue, Honorable Smith. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks for the presentation. And uh, we also wish to comment what PSC has done by 2020. But although one is still concerned, when you look at the report, according to the, to the report, it looks like SMEs, SODs, EAs are failing to comply by not submitting their financial disclosure form. So is there any follow-up that is being done to check as to why they are not complying by submitting their disclosure form. Thanks, Chairperson, for now. Thank you. Honorable Nduli. Thank you, Chair. Chair, I'll also plead for my, for my um, video to be switched off with, with your permission, Chair. Please. Chair, um, my my colleagues. Oh, firstly, we we welcome the the presentations. Um, my colleagues have have covered a lot of um issues. Um, particularly uh, honourable um Lesoma. 
he she covered me uh, in some of the issues. Uh, she, on top of what Honorable Lesoma said, the naming and shaming. I wonder, Che, if there is a way of um, sort of a regulating, regulating on suspension without pay. to apply this uh, regulations, particularly on the repeat offenders. I've got a serious concern, Chair, and the meeting to, to say we have even repeat offenders meaning that um, you did it and and you just uh, got away with it without any harsh uh, punishment i i i, I think Chair, it's high time that we apply harsh rules on such to protect uh, the public service. And uh, we noted the decline. We noted the decline, but uh, it shows that uh, this thing has been rooted there are some people who are just um, uh, defying. If you defy, the, the department must respond to you. But, but, but there's another thing, Chair. I wonder, there was a mention of a Schedule two, I think it was a uh, PSC, if I'm not mistaken. Just to elaborate on that one as to who, how, and when. And Chair, if we can see that uh, that one, also doesn't open the the loophole certain loopholes um chair i i, I think chairperson in terms of subs i don't know uh, whether we can have um, the department can think of the, the discussions for the establishment of a special team, national, not to have the subs from KZN investigating uh, people, the officials from, from KZN, and also To, 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 to show the seriousness on the matter, to have a special team maybe on this uh, financial year and also change from time to time. Because for me, the, 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 the involvement of SARS as well, because 
um, you you saw that uh, the, 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 the Department of Subs is also mentioned to have been involved in such. The involvement of Subs is a, 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 a worrying factor because those are the people that are supposed to protect us and, and, and to protect the state. Che, I think uh, that's my take for now. Thank you. Honorable Ndoli, Honorable Ndzepe. Thank you so much, Honorable Chairperson. I would like also to welcome the presentation, all the presentation that was presented here at the Portfolio Committee. Uh, first question from the Public Service Commission. Uh, in terms of the SMSs, disclosed after the set date and to those who did not disclose at all be, they, because they know that they must comply by disclosing no matter the minister was new and then it was said that uh, it, there was a disciplinary uh, hearing disciplinary that was being taken for in terms of the disciplinary was taken but it was a verbal warning so according to EAs must take decisively, they must act decisively. I don't think that when we talk about decisively, the warning letters can act as decisive. There must be a serious action must be taken from, to them because this thing of this, the, this issue emanates from the fifth parliament. And then when we come in on the sixth parliament, it, it was already there from the past one. So we are going to deal with this issue until Jesus comes, because this needs to be dealt with. with immediate effect. You must deal with it and done so that the other ones must not repeat what the others did before. And then the other question in terms of the GPSA is, um, with uh, employees of uh, the, the with the employees of the SAPS identified to be in conducting business with the state and with 49 of the of them being active directors of the companies registered on the CSD and 10 employees who identified were not recognized question is is this an ident indication of policy gap. Number two, will this be a need to identify this gap with a view to amending legislation or improving on regulations? And then the other question is, what led the department to include meaning the statistics of national department? What led the department to conclude that only 17 departments down from 29 possibly have employees conducting business with an organ of state. And then the last thing, honorable chairperson, I would like to ask or to request the chair, uh, can we request the overview report which was made by uh, DM Chikunga, which was so informative building the Department of Public Service and Administration. Really that overview, according to me, it was good. And then it was maybe going to build us and even the ones that is in the Department of Public Service and Administration. I'm requesting if can we have that, that overview report with due respect. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Thank you, uh, Honorable Mutipe. I think the, the Honorable DM is hearing your request. Uh, she, will, she will do that as you have requested. Now let me allow the Public Service Commission and the, and the department to respond to questions raised by Honorable Members. A public service commission. Uh, Honorable Chairperson, uh, yeah, as, as I've indicated, my video is still 
uh, much of a problem. I'll, I'll sort it out next time uh, it will be sorted out. Let me indicate that a number of questions that have been raised is mainly around a uh, regulatory framework, the laws and uh, the regulations. Uh, as the Public Service Commission, our duty is to uh, scrutinize and check if laws have been complied with, and if not, recommend that disciplinary action in terms of the, in terms of the public service regulations are enforced. So when it comes to officials who are repeat offenders, we were concerned as the commission that uh, in the previous year we recommended, and then uh, some of the EAs become satisfied with the risk, uh, uh, explanation from the officials, and then the officials do it again the following year. So, and some of the EAs will come with written warning, and then even in the next year, so uh, uh, warning, and then even in the next year, uh, put uh, another warning. So maybe that's where we need to tighten uh, the regulations and ensure that uh, you cannot get uh, the same uh, sanction for an offense on uh, 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 in two successive years. So that uh, uh, if you get a warning this year, the following year should be the final written warning or uh, uh, people should be uh, suspended without pay, yes, uh, one uh, honorable member indicated. So I think that's where we need to tighten up uh, uh, as far as uh, compliance is concerned. The overview report that we tabled in, in parliament uh, maybe the portfolio committee should be should engage with other portfolio committees. For example, if we take the Joint Standing Committee on Intelligence, so the portfolio committee should discuss about uh, the issue to uh, uh, submit the financial disclosure and then uh, uh, be able uh, uh, to hold the Department of State Security Agency to account for those officials who have not uh, uh, complied. And the same could be done with health, with education, et cetera. So this report should not end only at the level of the portfolio committee on uh, public administration, but that it should be shared with portfolio committees or, uh, on health, education, et cetera. And so that those portfolio committees uh, do engage the ministers and the DGs accordingly on uh, these issues. When it comes to uh, the EAs not, uh, let's say the HOD or the DG submits by the 30th of April, and then the EA uh, doesn't submit to the, uh, to the commission, there isn't a, a policy gap in that regard. Because from one, one May up to 31 May, 31 days in which the EA has a responsibility to ensure that he or she checks the, the because it's only one form of the DG or, or the uh, HOD, that uh, the DG or the HOD submitted correctly and check a, 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 a conflict of interest, if, if any, so that when they send to the PSC, they send the full picture of what that uh, uh, official has submitted. Uh, where there may be a policy gap, I, actually, I think it's a duplication that the PSC should uh, uh, investigate if there is conflict of interest, but that does not absolve the GIS and the EA from investigating conflict of interest. So I think uh, maybe PSC and Public Service and Administration Department should work out and see how to improve the e-disclosure system to make sure that there isn't uh, uh, a lot of duplication uh, in, in the work that we are doing. Uh, more so that we do not have sufficient resources to be able to, uh, uh, to, to do the same work that departments uh, are supposed to do. So the e the EOs, ethics officers, must be capacitated accordingly to be able 
to enter into the e-disclosure system, into CIPC uh, system, and be able to scrutinize uh, uh, before a report is sent to the Public Service uh, Commission, so that the Commission uh, uh, is doing uh, assurance to the portfolio committee or portfolio committees that indeed uh, much work is being done in the different uh, departments. And then when it comes to the issue of state security agency, we engaged with them fully in about two or three meetings. And then they were under the impression that for security reasons, uh, they may compromise uh, the security of the country when officials are, are, are disclosing their financial interest. We then indicated that uh, the, the commission is not interested in uh, uh, those issues of uh, uh, state security per se, but uh, is interested in senior managers to disclose their personal financial interests, uh, the houses they own, the 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 the, 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 uh, the companies they are directors in. Uh, the vehicles they own. So it is personal issues and not issues related to the day-to-day -day operations of uh, employees. So they checked with the inspector general and the inspector general agreed with them that they uh, need to uh, disclose because it's disclosing personal interests of officials and not state security uh, issues. But even after that, they still did not uh, uh, disclose. And that's where the Joint Standing Committee on Intelligence should be able to hold the Minister of Intelligence accountable to say uh, they agreed to disclose, but still they didn't uh, do that. So I think collaboration here is going to be more uh, important. And then with respect to those that this did not disclose completely. That is a, a misconduct in terms of the code of conduct uh, for public servants. And then disciplinary action must take place. And then uh, that's where I said, maybe there's a need to tighten up sanctions uh, so that if uh, uh, an offender is a repeat offender, that sanctions becomes more harsher and that uh, officials may be uh, suspended or even uh, uh, dismissed if they are not interested in following the law. Because uh, uh, in chapter one of the constitution, uh, that's where we say there is uh, one of the values, founding values is supremacy of the constitution and the rule of law. So if the law prescribes in a particular way and officials are not following uh, the law, what more about members of the public uh, such. So it is important that especially senior managers must lead by example in terms of implementing public service regulations and the public service, uh, public service act. When it comes to uh, departments that uh, uh, implement the regulations, we see that over the past few years, there's been a decline in terms of uh, uh, the offenders, uh, those who are not uh, conducting business with the state, the number is uh, increasing. Or the, those who are conducting business, the number is uh, declining. So that is an encouraging sign. But uh, again, SAPS uh, needs to ensure that those officials uh, that have uh, violated PEM Act are charged and then they are uh, taken on trial and then uh, criminal uh, charges, I mean, criminal sanctions, uh, sanctions against criminal activities are taken. However, it is important to note that even SUBS itself, uh, uh, there are still officials, the police, who are still conducting business with the state. So somehow, one way or the other, there may uh, be some conflict of interest in some of those policemen who are conducting business with the state, taking action against other officials 
who are conducting business with the state. So uh, there is a need uh, to uh, collaborate and ensure that the conflict of interest is removed and then that uh, the officials are taken uh, on board accordingly. So uh, IP needs to be brought in as far as uh, the, 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 the officials in SAPS are concerned and then SAPS uh, take action on the rest of uh, other officials. With respect to uh, uh, the re review of regulations, the regulations were reviewed in 2017. And if you, if you check uh, uh, the submission from 2017 upwards, so in 2017, it was 95%. Uh, and then in 2019, uh, 2018, 19, it was 99%. And then uh, it has gone slightly in 1920 to uh, 18%. So the review uh, has taken place and uh, the, the, the improvements have been put into the public service regulations. And I think that's what portfolio committee and, and other portfolio committees should also help in that regard to ensure that the review is done on a regular basis uh, and not to take uh, 16 years before the review, like uh, the first review uh, from 2001 to 2017. So maybe every five years, uh, I'm not sure that uh, we need to discuss that with the DPSA, with the minister to say how, how long should the review be on the, uh, co uh, the code of conduct and the uh, financial disclosure, which are all covered in the public service regulation. Maybe five years may be um, uh, the most uh, important uh, to, to look at. Uh, the other questions, let me leave them to the DDG uh, to, uh, to, to answer on those questions, if ever I've uh, missed other questions. DDG. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chairperson. There's just a very few questions that I will deal with. Um, the first one is that issue of having a system to identify uh, DGs and HODs who have submitted to their uh, EAs, but for whatever reason, EAs do not uh, release the documents to, to Public Service Commission. We welcome that and we will we will, we will uh, put that in place. The Honorable Tebekulu identified something very critical uh, in this area where, where employees will bypass the system by using relatives, kids, uh, parents uh, to, to, to be the ones who, in whose names companies are registered. But the answer to that is going to be the, the, the lifestyle audit, which will, will, will follow the, uh, the flow of monies uh, and check what is happening. Because it tells you money flows into this account. It's an elderly person retired. Then it goes back to son or daughter. Then it will tell you that this company has been registered just for the sake of circumventing the, 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 the regulations that are there. So it is the uh, work that is in the pipeline. The DPSA is final, uh, helping us finalizing the lifestyle audit. And, and that uh, is the, is the uh, uh, process that will be able to, to, to sift out those that are trying to circumvent the system. Uh, Honorable Schreiber, with regard to the uh, low conviction rate, fully agree that uh, um, the information is readily available. You have payments that were made into this uh, company that is owned by this director who's an employee of the state. Um, the low conviction rates can be attributed to now it means something is wrong when it comes to leading of that evidence before the jury or the person who would make a judgment, um, which we, 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 
SPSC would be able or, or willing to reinforce if there is a disciplinary hearing and we are called to come and clarify the significance of the non-disclosure and how does it impact on service delivery to demonstrate the seriousness of the offense. Because if it is not articulated properly before a magistrate or before a disciplinary panel, there's bound to be a, 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 a outcome that is not satisfactory. And many departments rely on labor relations officers. Sometimes they just want to get rid of the matter quickly without understanding the impact and the far reaching uh, uh, implications of such decisions. Um, uh, I'm going to move on to um, Honorable Maluleke. Honorable Maluleke said we should share some good stories. There were many officials who registered on uh, first in directorship of companies as well as on the central uh, uh, supplier database. But once that message went out of saying um, doing business with the state is being uh, 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 criminalized. It's now outlawed. We give you this period to, to make your choices, either deregister from companies and um, or stay with them, but disclose properly so that appropriate action can be taken. So, so many officials deregistered from companies which listed them as, um, as directors. And, and in some instances, you would have seen in our presentation, we say where EAs would be consulting with officials, the, there would be a, a, a response coming back saying, the EA is satisfied with the response. In other instances, you will find deregistration is in in, in, in progress, it has not been finalized by the company registration authority, but the official would have uh, sent a letter and request that I'm deregistering as a director of this company. Uh, please remove my name. Um, so, so that's some of the things that we can share with you, but what a, a, a issue was raised relating to the deterrent effect of, of the conduct of officials who are not disclosing on time, who are not disclosing certain registrable uh, interest, um, how we handle this matters as departments determines the deterrent effect of, of our uh, uh, to other officials who would uh, 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 contravene these this sections. So, there is a case currently ongoing of a head of department in the Northwest who undertook a trip um, somewhere to India um, and did not disclose with family which was being paid by the service provider. So, so the evidence um, is overwhelming that that forms part of its corruption, its gratification, because if this service provider is rendering a department, I mean service in your department and paid for your for your holiday trip, uh, it is regarded as corruption. So it's it's work in progress. We will we are supporting the law enforcement in processing that case before the courts in the northwest. So the outcomes from there will 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 depending on, on what the judges have seen, what have we presented, we will use those as, um, as examples to other officials who will, who will uh, tend to violate our regulations. Um, the, the reason for, for those who do not submit at all, most of them we find they either on suspension, others are on prolonged sick leave, what we call PLIR in, in the public service. 
but we have impressed with the departments to say even if a person is on on um, suspension the disclosures they are made electronically nothing would prevent them from logging onto the system and disclosing their registrable interest so we have this ongoing interactions with uh, with uh, ethics officers in the department we sometimes convene uh, workshops just to go through some of the critical and prominent issues they must they must pay um, attention to. Uh, Honorable Muzipe, on EAs need to act decisively. We agree with that. Um, our labor laws uh, indicate that discipline is progressive. I've seen in a certain instance where we have repeat offenders, a department will start with a, 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 a written warning, then it will follow the next disclosure cycle with a final written warning. Then in the third year, then they, they, they institute a disciplinary action. But we agree that we need to have harsher sentences here or or punishment that will deter others from, from uh, committing the same uh, 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 offenses many times. So you need not even try to commit it once. The last one is um, once there was a question relating to disclosure of directorship by Honorable Malulek. What then? If I've disclosed a, a, a directorship, what do you do? We, we take that information and run it uh, um, uh, parallel against the systems of government, payment systems of government to, to check if there was any payment made to that company. And uh, then we take it from there because this is centralized. It's all uh, um, data that is available in the domain of national treasury which they share with us. And then we will see that, oh, this company was paid. Uh, then from there, we, we, we scrutinize and say it was an actual conflict of interest uh, or it was, a, it was not disclosed or the person had, had um, what do we call it? authorization to conduct business, but um, that there's no, Currently, you cannot be authorized to conduct business with the state because that is a criminal offense. You can only be authorized to conduct business, but it, it, it should not have anything to do with the state. That's what we call other remunerative work. Um, I'm going to pause here. But we will continue to engage with departments uh, to, to, to share with them the best practices, the advices we get from these committees uh, in order that the management of, of these areas can be improved. And in so doing, it will improve uh, good governance in the public sector. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Thank you, Candy. Okay, Department Chair, respond. Can, but Chair, before, before the department comes in, can I just clarify one last part uh, that the TTG indicated? The issue of uh, if officials uh, are directors in companies and those companies are not conducting business with the state, they, uh, the companies that the official uh, uh, own uh, uh, raises a potential conflict of interest in the sense that uh, the state resources may be used by the official for the, uh, uh, for the interest of that private company. Like for example, time uh, that uh, the official is uh, employed to, and then also the computers, uh, the phones uh, that are used for that private company. So it brings more pressure on departments to tightly monitor those officials who own companies, which may or may uh, which may not be doing business with the state. I think that's uh, uh, an area that needs to be looked into. Uh, that uh, officials need to 
put all their time to the department and not to the private companies that they own. Thank you. This department can now respond. Chairperson, Thank you, Chairperson. Can, oh, can, I, can I start then? You, you, you will yes, follow a few things. Um, and, and any official who's doing remunerative work uh, outside the public service, but within a public servant, has to get a permission from the minister and the DG. And, 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 and it's supposed to be like that. But Chair, uh, thank you for the questions and, and the comments that the members of the portfolio committee have made. And, and, and we actually can pick up their frustration and, and, and the correct frustration on their part, not on the good work or the absence of good work that we are doing, but I think of the subject itself. Uh, the fact that there are regulations that are saying to public servants, you shall not do so. And once you have that, the expectation is that then we don't have to sit here talking about public servants that are still breaking the law, breaching the law. And, 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 and that frustration is justified because it is also our, our, our frustration. Uh, we should not be talking about this we should be talking about what else must we add because already all public servants are complying with these regulations. It's supposed to be like that. Not to say we still have public servants who are involved who are doing these things. And I think I understand that. On, on the issue of, 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 of officials who allege that uh, politicians instruct them to do wrong things, I, I think the PFMA section 64 is very clear. If I instruct DG Olisa to do something that has financial implications and that is wrong, DG respectfully should request me to do that in writing. It, it, it doesn't give me a choice or here a choice. It says the, 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 the section says it must be in writing. So it's not like it may, it must be in writing. And the DG has a responsibility, of course, on her side as an expert to advise the DM or the minister to say, DM or minister, this request has these implications financially. And that can actually lead to irregular expenditure or wasteful expenditure or whatever, whatever. If I insist, then I have got, she must then request me to do it in writing and the DG has a responsibility to inform National Treasury and the Auditor General in terms of that section. So there are guidelines. It's, it's not even guidelines. It's the law that should be followed. And, and of course, you will understand the fact that sometimes they will then say, if you do that, then you, you risk being, you know, contracts and so on and so forth. But I think it's the law. You better lose your job than not to follow the law. But of course, the very fact that we not we not expecting these things, and that is why we employ DGs who are experts. But we also have the DGs, I mean, a, 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 a financial officers who are expecting these things, who can advise even politicians, so that their instructions are always within the law. I just want to mention that, and and I think the PS, uh, the chairperson of PSC and the representative of chairperson who has responded on the issue related to the big elephant. Uh, where uh, officials will use their relatives. And I think that that one was covered. I wanted to comment on that. But it actually tells you on the depth of this wrong attitude as it was articulated correctly so by uh, Honorable Nduli to say it shows the depth of this practice, which is sorrow. Remember at some stage, people were allowed, in fact, there was nothing that was guiding them. But then it was said later, you can, but you must declare. But then it is now said, you cannot. It is an offense and a misconduct. So whilst we report these things to, to, to the police, to NPA, departments are expected to discipline these people. And, and if the, the, the information is there and there's wastage of time, wastage of resources, because if we go to court, it's not for free, there's money involved. Somebody 
must actually be found guilty and something serious must happen to that official who is deciding not to follow the law. Um, uh, uh, I mean, Honorable Conde says EA seem not to be interested or concerned about having an ethical public service. I take it that she makes those comments out of frustration uh, because probably at this level, at, polit at, at portfolio committee level, we normally don't politic, we, we deal with issues. And I think she's saying it out of, out of frustration. The reason was why we're talking like this today, the reasons why we have these regulations it's out of what we want to see happening in the public service, eliminating and excluding everything that has the potential to undermine the ethical conduct of our public servants. Mm -hmm. And that is why we have all these regulations. The reasons why the portfolio committee has invited us to come and explain these things is because all of us together with the portfolio committee and the the, 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 the actions that we are taking, the, the DG, I mean, explained that the minister will want to address the foresight. Under normal circumstances, no minister will want to go in and attend an, a meeting of, 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 of managers. But out of wanting to take it to DGs himself, the minister has said, I will want you to put an item on this one so that I can come myself and address the DGs. And, and, and that tells you as to how serious we are so that these things can be eliminated. We don't have to come to the portfolio committee to be talking about even two officials that are doing business with the state. We don't want that. And I want to agree fully with, 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 with Honorable Gondwe when she said successful prosecution will serve as a deterrent and, and surely it will. And that is why we hand over and that is why we also have that interaction with SAPS, with NPA, with the Department of, of, of Justice, so that we can work to, working together, see a day where these things will go to court. But of course, we are overloading, court, overloading courts that are already overloaded with things that are supposed not even to be happening because public servants are supposed to know the law and they're supposed to know what they can and they cannot do. But I fully agree with her to say, once we have these things taken to court and people found guilty and sentenced to whatever, that will serve as a deterrent. I fully agree with that one. On the issues raised by Honorable uh, um, Nduli, and I think we've responded to that, Honorable Mutsepe to say uh, officials, even if the minister is new, the officials are not new. And, and however, I think it has been explained that maybe things then get taken to offices of ministers who time when they are new in the department will be overflowed with information, with documents that sometimes you're not even sure as to whether to sign or not sign. I, I, I do have sympathy on that one. However, it is also very true that the officials themselves will not be new and they will show, therefore know things that they should prioritize for the, the new minister to say, this is what you need to attend first because it has got some, 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 some closing dates. And if not, then we'll be found to have not uh, met the deadlines. And, I, and, and on, on that score, I might sympathize with her. I'm, I'm, I'm more than willing, Honorable Mutsepe, to share with you my overview uh, remarks and, and appreciate the fact that you found them to be uh, helping. I will, I will make them available because indeed they actually were prepared. But I think those are my, 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 my comments and I will allow the DG to, to respond on the technical questions. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, DG, come in. Thank you, uh, Chairperson, and thank you, Deputy Minister. I think the Deputy Minister, has covered a number of issues, Chairperson, as well as the Public Service Commission, because these issues are really interrelated. There was a, a, an issue around naming and shaming that was raised, and uh, our view as the department is that we have shared the information to the committee in terms of the departments that are involved and et cetera. We are not in a position to issue names of the people at this stage, because these are still allegations. So until at a point where the allegations have been confirmed through investigations and they go through those processes, the, 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 
um, the, 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 the law enforcement processes, we, we have um, a, a little bit of a constraint there in terms of specifically sharing the names. Uh, but any other information associated with this, we, 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 are, we are able to share. There was also a case in respect to clarity on cases where public servants were doing business with the state, not found guilty internally. I think um, uh, Dr. Solomon, I'd like him to speak in detail on this, but from, up, from my side, I understand that some of these cases, the reports, the departments do not give us the detail, but maybe uh, he may have a little bit of insight in respect to that. In terms of the breakdown figures per province, we've provided the figures, but what we have not done is to, is to, is to show um, directly next to each province or national department, the cases that have been resolved or cases that are in progress because there are such a few number of cases, but we, we, we will certainly reorganize that information in that context uh, if the committee wishes so. Um, uh, I think the issue raised around the use of relatives, um, yes, it would be difficult through this process of the department to get to that extent, but as the colleague from PSC was, was indicating, when you do proper detailed investigations, your, your, your lifestyle audits, you may be able to tread the trail of the money and where it finally lands. I've seen with, the, with some of the investigations the SIU has done in relation to the PPE that they've been able to pick up where there's also been involved of in, involvement of some relatives and et cetera. And these issues have been widely reported in media as well. Um, Unwillingness of departments to cooperate leads to challenge. Yes, I mean, I, I think that um, uh, there's, a, there's a challenge of um, a, a compliance and, and maybe, maybe there's a bigger root cause that we need to deal with. Maybe there's a lot of things that we're putting out there for compliance to departments. So they are unable to focus in terms of compliance. So we've also been doing our own reflection internally as DPSA, what are the what are the big, uh, what are the regulations that are having a, an impact that we need to focus on strengthening and work with departments around? Because um, 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 there is a sense that there are departments that are truly not complying and it doesn't matter what you do. I have spoken to the DGs myself. I have presented to Forsyth myself the, the, the report on um, financial disclosures uh, we have taken it to the last force for that in February. I have written so many letters. Yes, honorable members, the letters have deadlines, but when DGs do not respond to the deadlines, the next, the next escalation mechanism for me is to take the matters to the minister. So in this case, the minister intervenes and speak to the executive authorities and speak to all those uh, that are concerned. So the minister has now asked to say he wants to also go and address Pesal. He wants to go and address Fossad. And one of the interventions that we are doing, you'd see in our APP, we have a, an annual compliance report that we want to publish. So the, these issues around compliance, we are also going to address them as part of the annual compliance report we are going to publish. We will be doing this annual compliance report for the first time in the current financial year. And I think it's going to, in the manner that we are going to do, uh, I think it's going, to, our hope is that it's going to encourage people to, uh, to look at these issues of compliance because I, I think there's no DG who wants um, uh, to see their name being published as having non-compliant to, su to, to, to such critical regulations. Um, uh, yes, the failure of honorable Schreiber by the, five, by the departments, by some of the departments is a very serious issue for us and we agree on the political unplugging and, um, uh, and we've already escalated these matters to the minister. The issues around conviction rate, I don't know, I think Dr. Solomon can speak to that, but also I think SAPS must really come together with NPA that because we are working with them in the same in the same uh, platform, they should be able to come and speak to the committee in, uh, in confidence about what are the issues, maybe they're experiencing challenges that they are unable to share with us. From our side as DPSA, we have availed resources that we, we have, we have availed, uh, whatever capability that we have, including information and subs, they also have information from the PSC and et cetera. So they need to indicate what is making it so uh, difficult for them to move. We had also asked that there must be a dedicated unit, which in subs that uh, centralizes and track these uh, cases. 
I don't know if that dedicated unit is there, but I am aware that there's at least people who have been delegated this responsibility uh, who are in, com in constant communication with us as GPSA. We are concerned some of the cases, I think there's about 78 cases uh, confirmed which involve SAPS members. And out of those 78 cases, I think there's only about five or seven that are in progress even from SAPS. So um, uh, it is a matter of concern for us. In terms of, um, yes, the SSA declarations were of the same view that uh, these are personal declarations and uh, colleagues at the state security agency should be able to declare. I, the, the, the view and the decision that says they are not going to declare because they'll put the country in danger. Uh, we are not sure how the country can be put in danger through declaring your personal, how, ma how many cars you own, how much, how, how many houses you own and all these particular issues that we declare as individuals. In terms of the ethics officers training, I think uh, Dr. Solomon can speak in detail to that training, but this training, as I understand it, was also provided by SAPS because we, 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 we had to prepare the, the officers and the, the eth our ethics officers in terms of the work, the processes that they need to follow. Should there be a need for training by other entities as such as state like the NPA, um, I think that the colleagues can, uh, can go into detail in relation uh, to that particular issue. The discrepancy in figures, uh, may, please uh, Dr. Solomon speak on it. Um, 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 I, 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 I will leave that particular issue to you as well. Are we giving departments deadlines? Yes, certainly we are giving de departments deadlines. Some of them meet the deadlines, some of them do not meet the deadlines need for convention and throw people in prison, we, we truly agree. Our engagements with SAPS have really been about, let's move, let's have, let's have a case studies for people to know that I will not be, I, I should not be doing business with the state or I, I should not be conducting business with the state as a public servant because I will end up in jail. But um, the, the criminal justice system has its own life and its own way of doing things, which sometimes is not as fast as we wish it should be in terms of dealing with these particular matters. So we are in agreement in relation to that. And there is law um, uh, that uh, really empowers uh, SAPS to do what needs to be done in this, uh, in this respect. Um, the, then there was, uh, I think, Honorable Malulek, the concern of 98% SMS declaration. We agree we should be at 100%. There is uh, quite a number of departments nationally that are also at 100%. And um, um, uh, but there's still departments that are not at hundred percent, and we have raised, we have presented to FOSA to the Forum of Teachers, and to give feedback to the teachers and to ask them to really ensure that their officials do declare. But at the end, the responsibility for a declaration rests with the officials. The ethics officer do gives reminders once the system is open. We do give reminders. We send information to officials, but at the end. It's really a personal responsibility for the official to create time to go into the website and to do the declaration that is required. Um, uh, so from a, a point of view of measures to ensure all officials comply, the, the one issue for me that's outstanding is the commitment of the officials. Those who do not declare, it's their own commitment to the process that is outstanding. But from a point of capability, the capability is there for colleagues uh, uh, to declare. Can the system detect whether companies are doing, whether people are doing business with the state? I think this was a question from the PSC, but just to say there's lots of analysis that PSC gets done, does on the, on the cases and, um, and, and, and we work with them as well from DPSA. So, so they also have the other third parties that they work with to verify the information that we submit. Um, Suspension without pay uh, uh, in relation of, to those who may be repeat offenders. I think this is an issue we would like to take to our legal unit to, to further give us advice on it. We will not be able at this stage to give a, a yes or no in, in, in that. And um, um, then there was a, an issue around warning letters and access to, um, to the overview or by DM. Okay, the warning letters issue, I think that the colleague from um, a PSC also answered uh, very um, in, a, in a pointed manner, and I, I agree with that um, uh, response. 
Chair, the few issues that I've, de- I've um, forwarded to, 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 to Dr. Salomon, I would like uh, to request that he be given that opportunity. From our side, I'm done with the responses. Thank you, Chair. Is Dr. Salomon coming? Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I think I, I just want to start by thanking the um, honorable members for the words of encouragement because it's, this is a serious um, work and it's a difficult work, but it's also exciting work because we know we are really um, changing the way that public service is working by doing this work. So um, to address the, the first uh, issue of Honorable Lesoma, the issue of um, the statistics to look at um, comparisons, we have drafted two documents which I can make available to the um, uh, portfolio committee. The one is a statistical report, which indicates um, from um, 2019 to 2021. So that would give a good um, overview of the um, uh, progress made. And then there's also a second report, it's the investigation report, where we then take each department and indicated what the feedback was, what we received from them. So. Um, that we can make um, available. Then around the the clarity of um, the issue where departments indicated cases finalized and found not guilty. This is in cases where um, it was established that the employee is not a public service um, member or the person was wrongly appointed um, on the um, partial or where the person was actually appointed in official capacity. But I must also indicate that um, the responses that we got from the departments is not very um, detailed. So that is one thing that we want to uh, change and correct going forward. So that when a a, a department, for uh, example, indicate that they have laid criminal charges, that they can give us a case number, that they can give us the police um, official which they reported it to, And the same with the disciplinary hearings, because those disciplinary hearings should also be reported to the DPSA so that we can um, uh, also establish the um, uh, veracity of the investigations and the outcome thereof. So that is one of the tasks that we will take forward um, from from this um, day forward. Then um, regarding the comments of um, Honorable Bebe Kulu, there's always ways and means to bypass a system. And the one thing that um, gives me some hope is if there is proper investigation of cases, when the police investigate, they will find the fronting elements the, um, where you register people that your family members or friends, and then through the criminal process, that will be unearthed. So, even if there's a lifestyle audit process which will kick in later, we will also need to rely on all the, the methods and the tools that we have available to make sure that people do not bypass the system. Now, um, regarding the issue of um, Honorable Schreiber and the conviction rate, I think DDG McClatsy spoke at length around the conviction rate. But one of the issues that I can highlight is If the departments do not investigate, then the police cannot start with the criminal investigations. And we already experience difficulty of getting information out of the departments. So if we can um, improve that uh, point of entry, the responses of the departments, it will definitely impact on the conviction rate as well, because then the SAPs will have cases to um, to convict. That is just additional information or uh, my comments apart from what um, DDG McClatsy already spoke to. Then uh, Honorable Condwe, on the issue of um, the ethics officers getting trained, the training focus was on um, training them on how to investigate And the uh, police did an excellent job in this regard to take them through all the processes, indicating what the type of um, evidence is that they should look at, um, uh, assisting them on how to draft uh, 
uh, affidavit and the process that is required. And they also um, touched on the issue of what the NPA's role would be. So um, there was no need to involve the NPA directly because the um, SAPS um, took part of that. But I do take note of um, your comment that we should also involve the NPA in that process going forward. Then, um, uh, Honorable Condwe, on your issue of the discrepancy of the information, the SAPS found in September 2020 that based on the 1,539 cases they received from the DPSA based on 2020's um, uh, central database um, information, they sanitized that information and by September they found that of that, if they distilled and looked at the information, there's 579 left that um, they can work on. But the information, the 484, is which we then looked at in January. So that it means that there was actually a decrease from September to January, where that 580 or so fizzled down to 484, which um, is then the, the amount that we left with now in January 2021. Um, but of course, those information still need to be verified through the investigative process to um, see whether those people actually did do business with the state. So in terms of the deadlines for investigations, um, the DPSA cannot um, prescribe to the um, SAPs what time they must take to do investigations. But what we did um, agree to is we will have quarterly meetings between us to see that there's no um, uh, where there's challenges that we can unblock the challenges and move forward so that we do keep with timelines that uh, cases are not dragged um, for um, time immemorial. Um, the, the SAPs do have some um, dedicated people that um, I speak to regularly that provide me with updates, but I think um, the processes on their side, I, I cannot speak on their behalf where um, it would be um, uh, 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 better to request them to provide information on uh, their role and um, the investigations itself. Then um, my last input um, would be um, to respond to Honorable Motsepe, where she indicated that there may be some uh, policy or regulation um, shortcomings that we need to look at, and I want to fully agree with um, Honorable Butsepe. Um, the Technical Assistance Unit also has the mandate to look at norms and standards on ethics and integrity in the public service. And as we experience challenges and as we see certain things unfold or um, look at ways how to improve the system, we will definitely take that up and include that in future regulations and policies to improve the system so that going forward, we eliminate this um, challenge that we currently experience. Um, thank you, Honorable Chair. I think that's all from my side. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Members. Uh, thank you, uh, DM. Thank you, Public Service Commission, and everybody who has contributed to, to this meeting today. We, we have come now to the end of the meeting. I therefore no. want to, to adjourn this meeting. Chair. Thank you very much. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you very Chair. much. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson. Chair? Thank Hello. You, yes, I'm listening. Chair, I uh, long live, Honorable God. There is still a presentation from. Uh, is then outstanding uh, sorry, presentation. Yes. The, 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 still a presentation. Yes. From. DPSA you are breaking up, 
uh, DPSA on the government employees housing scheme. Oh, yes. yes. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry for that. <laughs> I'm in a rush. Eh? Uh, it's a housing scheme chair from... Yeah, DPSA housing scheme. Chair. Yes. Uh, DM, who's, who's, who's doing that presentation? DG Will. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Chairperson. I have a colleague from uh, the, the unit who has been delegated to present. Her name is uh, Kelly Mkonto. She's an acting chief director. Kelly, please, over to you. May I ask Kelly that we don't go through the detail of the presentation because it's quite long, and uh, I think the, the members are pressed for time uh, for other activities that they have. But over to you, Kelly. Okay, thank you, DG. I don't know in terms of the screen, do I um, share the presentation or um, someone is controlling the, um, the presentation? Can okay. the host guide turn the matter, please? Okay, you can share. Okay, I've shared, I've shared the presentation. Can you all see it? Yes. yes. And please put it on presentation format, Kelly. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you, TG, and um, thank you, honourable members, um, and also the DM. Um, uh, thank you, and thank you, the um, the honourable chair and colleagues. Um, good afternoon. I um, okay. I'm just trying to see if I can also share the um, this the. Uh, uh, what do I call it now? Because I'm trying to show my video and it's not showing. Okay. In terms of the uh, presentation, I'll follow the, um, the following presentation outline. I'll just briefly touch on the introduction and um, give a brief uh, background and the um, share on the new implementation strategy and the progress on the housing allowance. Um, and then talk to challenges and how we address in the challenges and then cover the, um, the conclusion. I'm pressing D DG now, it's not going, it's not moving. I don't know what's happening. Okay, the, um, the issue of home ownership is a challenge um, across the, um, the country. It's a challenge that affects a number of individuals individuals, uh, public servants are also faced with the um, similar challenges and uh, government and labor agreed that the historic housing allowance dispensation did not really translate into um, improvement in, in home ownership. And hence, when they did the analysis in 2015, they discovered that 70% of uh, government employees who were getting this um, housing allowance were not really um, owning homes. Then um, the, um, the two agreed to establish GHS. It was established in, um, as part of the PSCBC resolution of seven in 2015. And the main focus really of the GHS is to introduce and, 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 and enhance the housing allowance that enforces compulsory savings by employees. And also we involved in negotiating favorable terms with both financial and housing um, suppliers and introduce new services such as debt rehabilitation and debt counseling. As I indicated, it was established as part of uh, Resolution 7 of 2015. But the key main objectives are to support, educate, and advise employees on housing opportunities, enhance employees' access to affordable housing, promote home ownership, and facilitate asset security amongst government employees, and also assist employees to access affordable housing loans and finance, and assist employees who rent houses with a view to buy by assisting them with um, savings. And these are the four pillars that um, we'll be focusing on. Um, um, the first pillar focuses on housing allowance administration. The next one is um, employee empowerment, housing finance, housing supply and stakeholder management. We have started implementing four of the key uh, uh, pillars that we have um, identified here. We still have um, a challenge with the housing supply, but um, we'll be working on it in the new financial year. 
Now, in terms of the, um, the, the GHS since inception, and the DPSA has since uh, inception of the resolution created a ring fenced funded project management office, additional to the uh, DPSA to implement the resolution. However, we later really um, incorporated the functions of the um, of GHS into DPSA's function. Uh, we'll talk to that later. Establish an enrollment system. And we also established a call center where HR specialists, HR practitioners call in for um, assistance and also individuals who call in for assistance in terms of their savings. Provided education and um, support programs for employees and departments. And we've collaborated with National Treasury. They are managing our ILSF system um, and also collaborated with other finance institutions, facilitate home loans, uh, facilitated home loans for eligible employees and managed um, and, and maintained the ILSF. The, uh, the last part is an ongoing um, a, a process. Now, in addressing these, the DPSA has institutionalized functions within the um, approved structures of DPSA. Um, like I indicated earlier on that it was additional, um, but later it, it, it was institutionalized within um, DPSA. And um, the functions, I have alluded to these functions earlier, that's housing allowance administration, including ILSF, stakeholder management, education and outreach, client support services, housing finance, and facilitating the availability of housing stock. And um, in terms of the strategy, we, we came up with a vision and mission, really the key vision really is to make sure that uh, government employees access affordable quality housing for all public servants. Now, in terms of the strategic outcomes, um, we, we focusing on promotion of home ownership and efficient data management regarding the ILSF, employee empowerment, inclusive participatory and competitive housing finance solution, housing supply based on economies of scales and optimized partnership with public and private sector stakeholders. Now, just a brief progress. Um, the scheme is for level one to 10 um, uh, government employees and um, they are currently getting an allowance of 1,456, and it increases on an annual basis based on the CPI um, index. The, um, the employees who are not owning nor renting any um, accommodation do not receive the housing allowance. So here, you know, for employees to qualify, they need to apply and also enroll on the system for them to actually enjoy the benefits of, of GHS. Employees who are, who are homeowners receive the full housing allowance as an additional to their monthly salary. It's not a deduction. It's not like um, it's, it's they have to pay an extra amount. It's an additional uh, payment to their housing allowance. The housing allowance amount is adjusted. I spoke to that um, at, uh, in line with the average uh, CPI index of the previous year. Employees who are on middle management and senior management, that is level 11 to 16, um, do not receive um, a separate housing allowance. Um, however, they need to enroll for them to actually enjoy the benefits. Uh, we have assisted a number of, of employees who are you know, over 11, level 16, uh, 11 to actually not even 16, 11 to 14, who have come to us for assistance in terms of access to loans and um, counseling and, and debt rehabilitation. Um, employees who are, living, who are living in rented accommodation, these are tenants, have their housing allowance or portion of it uh, saved um, in ILSF. This ILSF is managed, we co-manage it um, together with um, treasure, National Treasury. Now, employees who joined the system after um, the finalization of the PSCB resolution, they um, do not get their money paid into their, into their uh, PESL. The money, all of it is saved. So that whole 1,456 um, is saved for them. Um, in preparation for um, a buying a house. Um, and then those who actually joined before the closure, because they started enjoying the 900 rents, um, it was decided that um, they'll continue receiving the 900 rents. However, the balance 
that is the balance between the 1,456 um, and 900, the balance, which is 556, will be saved for them on ILSF. And on the day they are ready and they're tired of renting, um, they, um, and they are ready and they have uh, approval uh, from the um, uh, banking institutions, they can access ILSF funding and that money will assist them as a deposit. Employees who are living in rental accommodation, okay, they only withdraw their savings for the purpose of acquiring a home, building or improving a home. Otherwise, um, they are not allowed to access the funding. And hence, I said it's important for employees to enroll and also apply for housing allowance, because you'll see later on, I'll speak to a number of people who are not enjoying this benefit. And these are people from level one to 10 who are not enjoying the benefit because it's either they do not know or um, they are not owning, um, they are not renting um, a facility, they're not renting. And, and they are also um, uh, probably not even interested you know, to, with the um, uh, uh, housing allowance that is given to public servants. Now in September, 2018, the determination, uh, an amended determination and directive on, on housing allowance for employees in the public service was issued, which, uh, spoke, uh, which addressed the delinking of the, um, of the allowance. That is spouses, um, they can actually both receive the, um, the housing allowance. Employees are assisted throughout all the stages of um, securing home ownership, and they are also educated. I spoke to that earlier on. The number of employees receiving housing allowance as homeowners increased um, from, uh, what is that number? Because I can't see it now on the screen, but it increased to um, 710, 173 as at um, at 20 uh, January 31st of January 2020, the increase is over. It's an increase of over 17,000, and it shows that um, uh, people are enjoying this benefit because it's a comparison of uh, June last year uh, to January. Just in six months, we've seen an increase of 17,000. Now, as at 31st um, uh, January, the number of employees re receiving housing allowance as tenants also decreased, which is a positive for us in that um, uh, people are beginning to want to buy houses instead of renting. So the number is going down and we're hoping that um, it will go down further um, before the, um, the end of the financial year. And accumulated savings are held in interest bearing um, facility, the one that is that we co-manage with National Treasury until such time that employees are are ready to access the funds for the purposes of acquiring a home, building or improving their, their, their homes. These savings shall only be accessed for the purposes of acquiring, I don't have to repeat that, I spoke to that earlier. And then the next slides really just gives a breakdown of the, um, the um, a consolidated, consolidated number of withdrawals from inception till June, 2020. We get this on an annual basis from National Treasury. I guess the next consolidation will be done in June, 2021. Um, these are the numbers. It shows that um, the number of employees who have acquired home ownership from ILSF um, um, have a 200, um, over 200,000 employees. And you'll see in the previous slide, we talked of 249, but it's those who they probably withdrew the money to improve their their houses, but um, they probably already um, had houses. And in terms of um, the clause of four point of the PSCBC res resolution seven of 2015, clause 4.1.21, um, it's important for employees to enroll, for them to enjoy the benefits. It's a challenge that uh, we are experiencing now that a number of them are not aware of this enrollment. And in support of the above, an enrollment system which enables the profiling of the employee housing choices. You see, when they enroll, it assists us also when we do an analysis on the uh, payments, um, on the performance of the, um, of the scheme and the number of people that are enjoying the benefits and also in terms of reducing the numbers as well of, of, of people who need to own houses. The DPSA is engaged in a process of, of 
uh, to ensure a systematic um, link between enrollment center, MOJEC origination, and access to finance and housing supply. So if we have these numbers, if these people are enrolled on the system, it makes our job a lot easier when we approach uh, partners and finance institutions and housing stock entities, because you know we're still uh, battling with, with housing stock. But if we have the numbers and people are enrolled, and we can actually just analyze the, um, the trends in terms of um, housing needs, it assists us um, um, to access this info. Now, as at 35, um, at 31st January 2021, only 341 um, government, 41,000, close to 342 government employees are enrolled, of which 135, 537 have title deeds. And we are only able to analyze this once in, um, individuals are enrolled because you know the enrollment system has quite a number of questionnaires that they need to populate and we also just uh, manage to follow the trends of performance. Now um, as at 30 December in terms of mortgage ba uh, uh, based products um, we managed to get information from SA Home Loan that um, the, um, we had over 18,258 GHS linked home loans to the value of over 12 billion. And we also have non-mortgaged uh, base products. These are products that range from 70,000 to 300,000 where you don't need to pay legal costs, transfer costs. And people who access this in the main are people who are involved with uh, PTOs, which is permission to occupy where you know, they actually just access the funds uh, from ILSF and also maybe even from um, at the banks to actually augment whatever building plans that they, they have already started in their communities. And now just to quickly run through the uh, GHS programs. Um, we have appropriate location of the um, the, of the GHS Advisory Council. Um, you know, PSCBC resolution indicated that there is a need for an Advisory Council. And we also picked up, you know, as we started with the implementation of this um, Advisory Council, that um, um, it was just not possible for us to actually follow what was outlined in the PSCBC resolution. And uh, we managed to get uh, the chief law advisor um, recommendations, and we shared the recommendations with the um, with the PSCBC. And we are now finalizing the uh, consultative forum, where six members will be identified by the employer, and the other six will be um, identified by labor. The um, other program is on the finance-linked individual savings uh, a program, which is FLIPS. This is. Um, in partnership with the uh, Department of Human Settlements Entity, which is the National Housing Finance Co uh, Corporation. We are in the process of really just finalizing the MOU in this regard, because this will also benefit uh, government employees in terms of accessing the subsidies that are available out there. Um, you probably all know that FLIPS is not only for government employees, it's, it's, um, it's for all the employees that are that, that earn uh, between 3,500 rands. And now the advantage with this is that they also increase the ceiling now um, from 15,000 to 22,000. So they get the money, the subsidy ranges between um, 27,000 to 121,000, depending on the um, salary band of the um, of the individuals that um, apply for the um, for the uh, for flips for Ed subsidy, the TPSA and DHS are exploring collaboration. This one is actually are we hoping that this process will be finalized before um, end of, of of February. Now the um, introduction of pension backed home loans. Um, this is a really a, a a huge milestone in, in a milestone in that. Um, you know, uh, government employees, others, they want houses, but, you know, when you look at their financial standing, it's just not um, good enough. So now if they have the, um, the support of GPF, uh, where they actually back their application, um, it assists us as well, even the um, uh, people who are really working on, on in, in GHS to negotiate um, favorable rates you know, for the employees, uh, because at least they know, banks will know that um, 
the um, the the payment will be is, is backed by by their pensions. The significance of pension back home loans is that many banks are prepared to lend money, and um, uh, to employees challenged because of their financial standing. The other one is the research on the use of ILSF funding. Um, we have saved a lot of money. Actually, as we speak now, this money is sitting, it, this was in December, it was 9.8, but end of um, January, we received um, uh, figures, um, but they indicated that they still want to verify one or two things. Hence, we're just speaking to the figure that we are completely sure of, that is 9.8 billion as at end of uh, 31 December um, uh, 2020, we are uh, Treasury um, is sitting with an amount of over 9.8 billion. And now we felt that maybe this is also another avenue that we could actually explore as GHS to see as to whether we cannot use this as a financing vehicle for those who want to access funding. That is, if banks are unable to actually assist those who want to access the funding, maybe we should um, explore uh, ways of accessing this additional funding to assist government employees. And then also we're facilitating availability of, of housing stock. Um, I indicated earlier on in terms of the pillars that um, I referred to that um, this is one area that really needs um, special focus. So a study to determine the role of GHS in facilitating the availability of housing stock will be uh, conducted in the um, next financial year. And we're hoping that also as we engage with uh, public works, um, this would also assist us in identifying um, housing stock that is very close to uh, people's um, work and um, you know, they save on transport and you find that housing stock is available, but it's quite remote for quite a number of government employees. So we're hoping that as we explore this area, we'll be able to identify housing stock that would really be convenient for a government employees. Now, in terms of the partners that um, we're forging um, to, we're hoping to um, um, engage with and the ones that we are also already working with, um, if we have partnerships with GPF, um, we have um, on, 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 on pension bank uh, guaranteed homes, Department of, of, of Human Settlement in terms of FLIPS, um, we have labor because obviously, you know, GHS was established um, um, in partnership with labor in 2015. We have housing finance institutions. We are currently engaging with um, housing development agency in terms of land and really negotiating better rates for government employees. We have national and provincial departments. And like I indicated, we are still in, um, in discussion phase with the um, a public work a public works regard, regarding housing stock um, infrastructure. Now, in terms of the challenges, uh, delays in incorporating the GHS as a, as a functional unit within DPSA uh, created, you know, this was actually also challenged by the, um, the, the budget constraints that we, we had. But now, like I indicated earlier on, now GHS is actually a DPSA a, a pro, a program. It is, it's been incorporated. We have a chief directorate uh, responsible for government employee housing scheme. During the period of reporting, I spoke to this earlier. We have over 217 uh, government officials that are not enjoying the benefits of um, the GHS uh, uh, benefits. And it also includes um, employees who have not applied for housing allowance. Employees transferred across, this is the other challenge, you know, the, the multi-systems that we use. Employees transferred across multiple systems. Um, we have SASA that uses um, Oracle and we have PESOL that is being used by Defense. And um, um, we find that, you know, when employees move from one department to the other, the information has to be captured manually. And that poses um, huge risks. And um, so, but we are engaging with the um, three entities as well um, in terms of just looking at how we can actually inter make sure that the three systems interface with each other. I know with PESOL, um, it might actually take a while, but um, 
um, their engagements already with um, SASA. A transfer of employees between system, okay, I spoke to that. Now, earlier when we started, we identified 70% of, over 70% of um, government employees were getting housing allowance. Now the number has actually uh, decreased to 35%. You know, when we started, we had over 70% of government employees who actually who did not own homes um, when we started in 2015. But now we have, we, ideally we want to get this number down, but currently we have 35% of employees who are receiving housing allowance and are still not homeowners. And this is due to a number of factors which are really alluded to those factors. And they are unable to get housing finance and um, the houses are, are not affordable. And there is also poor supply. If we can really just kickstart kick start this housing stock, um, responsibility, it would really assist a number of government employees in terms of accessing housing that is uh, within their affordability range. Um, the, um, the workshops, okay. Um, you know, COVID has really assisted us in really trying to really plan and think outside the box. However, there are areas that are really not um, easy to reach uh, via uh, virtual means, um, especially, you know, the because um, it's government, it's all government employees, you know, the school districts and um, some districts, they just do not have connectivity. And it's a bit of a challenge to actually just uh, engage with their HR um, uh, practitioners there because the HR practitioners are a key link in making sure that this program works. Um, they need to make sure that when they onboard their officials, they apply for housing allowance, they fill in the correct form, they enroll on the system, they educate them about the benefits of, of being enrolled and what they can actually um, access by, by, being, um, by, by, by enrolling uh, with, the, um, with the GHS. There is therefore a need to explore modalities on how to facilitate access um, to affordable housing, uh, to a affordable housing in appropriate um, location. And HR practitioners do not capture employees on time or provide employees with documents when they exit. It's important. This is actually a key challenge that we're dealing with, that um, HR practitioners do not really give employees um, the, the, the relevant um, documents when they exit. And by the time they want to access their benefits, the system has already kicked them out. JHS is trying to resolve cases where employees who have exited, this is actually a work in progress. Um, we're trying to assist because the, the list is just unbelievable. And um, we felt maybe there is a need to address this. Um, according to the latest report, 17,442 employees were declined loans um, others, they have garnishing um, orders and they or others do not have um, a deposit or their credit score does not really assist them. Um, now, in terms of analyze, uh, finalize addressing the, um, the, ch the challenges, um, we, I spoke to this one of finalizing the institutional form of, of GHS. The GHS supports, we also supporting HR practitioners and uh, finance practitioners, both in pro at provincial and, and national level. And we have also improved with the turnaround time to resolve employees' inquiries. Um, uh, some inquiries really are, are, are resolved immediately, but others would take five to 10, uh, uh, 10 days, and others even take lo much longer. Um, however, there is, um, we've got now a full dedicated team of, of officials that are attending to these matters. Some, inquiry, um, some um, inquiries require HR interventions in department which may take longer than the turnaround time. The team assists uh, clients through telephones. Um, we, I, I spoke to the establishment of a call center earlier on. We also respond to emails and then we also have walk-ins as well where we have face-to-face uh, -face, um, interactions. And this is actually, especially when it comes to government employees, but with HR practitioners, we've developed standard operating procedures for them. And we also um, have um, a, a, a developed a training manual for, 
for, for HR practitioners because we have realized that it's, it is actually a critical um, need in, in most departments. Now, um, the process of for consolidating and integrating the enrollment system origination and access to affordable housing is, is underway. Um, we need to really just um, speedily come up with a business case um, in this regard. And in conclusion, the access to and provision of decent housing um, is a national imperative and, and it really needs um, immediate attention. It is envisaged that the new implementation start, a strategy and the operating model might assist in uh, addressing these challenges. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Move yourself now. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> trying to do this. How do I get off? Okay. Yeah. Stop screen share, Kelly. Yeah, okay. Is it gone? I've, I've removed yes, it. Yes, it is gone. It is gone, Shelly. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, honorable members, apologies for prematurely <laughs> ending the meeting with this item still outstanding. Can I get uh, uh, members who want to, to discuss on this item? Civile Makabana Spunu Aspunu. Oh, I see Honorable Soma and Honorable Mutsipe. Honorable Chair, thank you very much for the opportunity. I think others they may wait and see. But nevertheless, let me do it now. And still, Honorable Chair, because of my barrette band that is showing behind me, let me uh, switch off my video through your permission. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm requesting to close the video. Thank you. Thanks very much, Honorable Chair. And also, uh, let me appreciate the, 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 the presentation. Uh, probably, Chair, one will say that the way is being presented, notwithstanding the administrative challenges that may be the department has, uh, but it's not so much encouraging. I will tell you why. We always say that we are a very caring government, especially the, South, the Republic of South Africa government. It's a very caring one. But the way we, 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 we treat this issue uh, is like it's one of those, by the way. Uh, but also I was worried when the presenter speaks as if, uh, as if uh, this item, it's, uh, it's for the first time. Uh, and uh, probably I will borrow from her words. She said, we, if we can kickstart this, this scheme, uh, and I got worried in her process when she borrowed those words, that what does that mean? But nevertheless, Chair, let me just go straight to my questions. The, the very most important one is that the, also the scheme, it was responding to the middle, missing middle in terms of house ownership or home ownership, uh, public servants as it were. And, uh, and the way we are dealing with it, it doesn't seem like it was to respond to that. Why I'm saying that chair one is the issue that those ones who doesn't meet the threshold of the, 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 the borrowings or, or the credit score, they don't meet the credit score. Uh, then it, it doesn't say what do we do. The president didn't talk to that. Because also what also this one was trying to respond to, taking from the history was that our public servants employees, I want to be narrow to, to, to just to focus on them, is that they are very much indebted. 
and they end up not having money to 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 acquire decent uh, shelter for themselves because they are, they belong to the middle uh, missing middle because they can't also get the the government uh, subsidized home which are RT, which we term them RTP houses and all that. Hence, I'm saying that I, I'm not so encouraged uh, with the progress thus far. But also the other one is that with the with the financial institutions that are being set here, their interest rates are very high. I thought the housing scheme, as the scheme as it were, was also going to try to do that. Your PIC and your and your GPEF also, in terms of their bank charges are very high, which means then they make you more poorer than yesterday. Uh, and I thought that the department was going to assist us to say, how do we best uh, uh, assist those middle, uh, missing middle as it way. But also the other, the, the, the second one for me, Chair, is that probably is a take home one, this point that I'm going to raise now. There's this uh, a mega scheme in Pretoria that the president spoke about, uh, which was launched last year. If then government can also see how can we also see that our public uh, employees benefit from that. Because I know that government also have contributed there in terms of investing in the, in the, in the infrastructure, underground infrastructure, which it is responsibility as government to invest. But for the top structure as a, as a, as a, as a, as a battering one to say if there are those ones who are interested. Because if you go and study the Rwanda model, it does in a way respond to what we intend to do. The, the, the other one chair that I would like to, to ask is that the pension back home loan financing involves the, G, the GEPF is a guarantee, but also it says that then we're saying our employees must then tap in in their pension before they even retire and also enjoy that pension fund. Uh, I, I, I'm not too sure why we opted for that, but also it says that it reminds me, which is a by the way issue, which has got nothing to do with this one, is because also the, the GEPF. Probably let's also in one of the good days chair, with your permission of course, is to get a, 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 a status progress and a financial standing of the stand of Saka. I've heard in the news that they have also been able to recoup some of the funds and all that. And how much then is going to be paid back to the GEPF uh, the money that has been sent in that uh, stand of Sarka, as it were. In terms of the GESS, you know, the Advisory Council Chair, where the members of the, of the Advisory Council, uh, which the department is the mainstream employees of the department, are recruited from outside specifically for the purpose. Now, that legal requirements are that they must be located within the public safety, the PSCBC, what is going to happen to those ones, employees who, who are outside that, but also who are public employees, public government, uh, public service employees, if one can get the, cancer, the, 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 the clarity on that. And also when we cancel our employees, uh, in terms of ad advising and educating, educating them on the scheme, do they indicate why some are still reluctant to own the houses and prefer to rent, but it's a personal choice. But also on this one, the presenter spoke about that uh, uh, we are unable to interact with the HR uh, practitioners of various departments as it were. But I, 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 would, have, I, I would have loved the, the presenter to appreciate that the COVID-19, the scheme was before that. And then it still talks about the interest of those employees who doesn't then, who still invest on the housing scheme, but also their money, they are not utilizing it. Who benefits on the interest on, of, of that? Probably the other questions, Chair, so that I don't speak long, but they, they, I'll just ask the last two questions. After the introduction of the, of the, of the, just the scheme strategy, is there any increased uptake scheme of, of that? Because you have now, introduce a new strategy that intended to do that, which is linked to say why then the, uh, our employees are reluctant, reluctant to take the, the, the scheme as it were, because it's their money anyway. 
especially those ones who are investing in it uh, in terms of the money that gets uh, deposited to the scheme. Chairperson, with that, the other questions will follow uh, in writing, but one will really appreciate moving forward that we, we should be seen also having interest to our public servants or owning this, the, the, the houses as it were, or having a decent shelter as, as they are, as, they, as it were, because they are in a miss, missing middle and we don't want to create a, a, what's it, homeless people, unintended homeless people, because also they're ever indicted as well. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Thank you, Honorable Mzipe. Thank you very much, Honorable Chairperson. Yeah, uh, I've, uh, I would like to ask this question that uh, the department, the debt re rehab plus debt counseling, how is the department assisting these employees in terms of these two issues? Number two, employees who are not owning or renting any accommodation does not receive housing allowance which criteria do you use to determine this issue? Because really, they are also the employees of the public, they are also public servants. Why don't they get these allowances? And then the third question, spouses are both receiving housing allowance. Do they get equal benefits if they are married is the question. And then I've got the, re the recommendation here. Why don't the department make necessary arrangement or amending some other legislation in order to make all the emplo employees to qualify for housing scheme or loans? Because really to have house and working in the Department of Government is where the employees feel secured and the housing allowance does not even make them own houses because it is still little. And the worst part, not everyone do get that allowance and do get, they must get the decent houses. To get a decent house is not a privilege, it is a right. Thank you so much, Honorable Chairperson. Thank you, uh, Honorable Mutsipa. Can we get a response uh, now? from the question raised. That's it. Oh. Honorable, okay. honorable. Okay. Chair, I have my hand up. I see your hand, you raise it late, I see it now. Okay, take the platform, Honorable Kondre. Yeah, Lebo Khamud, let's do it. Um, let me start by thanking DPSA for their presentation. Um, and uh, my questions are basically three questions. Um, the first one is in the presentation, they indicate that as at the 31st of January, 2021, the number of employees receiving housing allowances tenants decreased. I want to find out whether um, the decrease in the number of, 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 of employees receiving housing allowance is linked to the increase in the number of employees receiving housing allowances as homeowners. I just want to find out what the cause for the decrease uh, uh, in, in, in the number of employees uh, receiving housing allowances as, as tenants um, is. My second question is, um, I just want a confirmation, uh, you know, just a, uh, an idea of the total number of government employees that qualify for this housing allowance. Um, and how many um, of these employees are currently receiving that housing allowance, either as tenants or as homeowners? Because yes, I know you indicated that approximately 700,000 are receiving housing allowances as homeowners and approximately 240,000 are receiving housing allowances as tenants. And then you also indicate that 217 do not receive a housing allowance either because they are not um, owning a house or renting a house. So I just want to, to, to get a full figure around how many employees are actually making use of, uh, qualify for the scheme and how many are actually benefiting from the scheme either as tenants or homeowners. And then um, you further indicated that 35% of employees receiving housing allowances do not own houses. Now, just to piggyback on what Honorable Lusoma said, um, 
what 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 are you intending to do about that and what are your recommendations around improving that because you see one of the objectives of the scheme is to promote uh, home ownership and to facilitate asset security amongst employees of government and if you have you know 35 percent of employees um you know possibly qualifying for that for the scheme and not making use of it then this defeats the purpose of this objective thank you chairperson Thank you, Honorable Conduit. Can we get responses now to the question raised? Thank you, Chairperson. Deputy Minister, I don't know if you ask, want to start first. Uh, did you know you, you can go ahead? Maybe to, just to, 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 to mention, Chair, that uh, indeed there the, the, the are challenges, there will be challenges, a scheme such as this one. However, what makes us happy is the fact that we're now talking about a scheme that is being implemented. So we're no longer at a primary level. We're dealing with challenges at a secondary level to say what are the challenges of implementing the scheme. Indeed, there are shortcomings here and there, and we're attending to them. We're having meetings with PIC, with the National Treasury, with ourselves. We're looking at everything about the contract itself, but about everything else in the scheme so that the public servants, as, as Honorable Lisoma is saying, does achieve its own objectives. The very fact that it was meant to address the public servants who were and who continue to be the missing uh, middle and therefore do not qualify for government uh, RDP houses, but also cannot get loans from banks because of their indebtedness. We are actually attending to that, working together with even unions, we're meeting with them, we're getting feedback from them, and we're attending to some of the problems. I think I just want to say that however the scheme is there, and we're trying every day to improve it. Thank you. DG. Thank you, Deputy Minister. Uh, Kelly, I'm going to ask that you first deal with some of the questions because they are quite um, operational in terms of the information that is required. So over to you, Kelly. Okay, um, uh, thank you, DJ, and and thank you for the uh, for the questions um, asked as well. Um, the um, whew, where do I start now with the uh, with the question? Because they needed the number of of the total number of government employees that um, are supposed to um, uh, get a home allowance. We have over 700,000 um, employees. Um, if I'm not sure if I'm responding to that question uh, uh, properly. We have over 700 um, employees and I indicated in my presentation that um, we have over uh, 249 that are receiving this, um, the, 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 the allowance as, as, as tenants. Um, and when I said the number has increased, it therefore tells us a good story that um, we're having more government officials now owning houses that they have moved. They have accessed the funding from ILSF and others have also qualified from the um, FLIP subsidy that they, um, they access their savings and they also managed to get a subsidy from um, FLIPS um, that would really assist them in putting down deposits um, mm -hmm. towards their, their houses. So the, um, the number has increased um, in terms of home ownership. When the tenants decrease, the number of home ownership increases. And um, Madam also mentioned the other uh, a challenge in terms of those that are not renting and, own, and owning um, houses. Why are they not benefiting? It, it was clearly stipulated that it's important for uh, government employees who fall within that band of one to 10, that they actually apply for housing allowance. And um, we have discovered that um, most of them are not doing that. They're not taking advantage of really applying for the um, housing allowance. You'd recall, we mentioned that before 2015, uh, 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 people used to get this housing allowance, but they did not have houses. However, from 2015, we said it's important for them to apply for housing allowance, for them to enjoy the benefit. They need to apply and also enroll on the GHS system. So you find that um, a number of them are not, it's either they are not aware 
um, of these benefits, or maybe there's just no interest. Uh, we are currently investigating um, all these causes, um, but what we have actually identified as a key challenge was that um, a number of them are not aware that they need to register for them to actually enjoy the um, housing allowance benefit. And then in terms of the, um, uh, yeah, the other question was um, around the pension backed um, uh, allowance. Uh, it does not mean when they say pension backed, it, 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 it acts as a guarantee that should they really default on paying their houses, um, um, at least there is a backup, but it does not necessarily mean it will really eat up their uh, pension fund. It actually just assists in negotiating uh, better interest rates um, for some government officials because some banks, they need guarantees to say, you know, I, um, as, as um, one of the, um, the honorable member indicated earlier on, a number of them are really hugely indebted and the money is just not enough and they just cannot make ends meet. But if there is this um, guarantee that says, you know, this is a member that we know and um, their salary is deducted and here's a pay slip and, and, and here is assurance of the, um, the pension that we should they default on their payments, at least there is a backup, but it does not necessarily mean it will be accessed immediately. It, it, it is only accessed only if they um, struggle to pay with the um, uh, monthly payments. I think I've, I've answered most of the um, operational questions, TG. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Um, I think that a few of the issues I would have wanted to say in answering questions, Chair, is just to say that uh, the strategy the strategy that we just presented, the pillars of, was approved, I think, about three, three, three months ago. So the process of rolling out that strategy is, has, has already started. And uh, yes, there are engagements at, um, um, at the level of the PSCPC between the unions and the, uh, particularly, in fact, even outside the PSCPC between the unions and the executive authority of the department on these particular matters. Um, the, the, the labor has really communicated what, what some of the expectations uh, and interests are in respect to this. Just to clarify that this is a benefit. So a benefit, you can only access it as an employee by having a house or by renting a house. Um, uh, so, um, and, and, and with the previous dispensation where employees were allowed to rent a house and were given an allowance for renting a house, but with the current dispensation, the, the intention is that all employees must own their own properties, they must have a house. So the benefit get uh, activated. If you are not owning a house, then um, um, and, and you are an employee who is joining, who's joining the scheme after the dispensation uh, in respect to, uh, to rentals of the houses, then you will certainly not be able to tap into this benefit. Uh, so it's, it's just important to clarify that benefit um, uh, for the level ones to 10, it's open for all the employees, but they have to activate it by, uh, by that. The issue around awareness is an ongoing issue. And one of the um, decisions we had made in the current, in the incoming financial aid is that we must have a dedicated awareness uh, program with our employees and engagements using the available means of engagement because yes, COVID has happened and COVID is forcing us to do things differently. So we must be able to use these platforms that we have currently access to. The, the reality of the situation is that some of our employees, especially at these levels, do not even have access to these digital, to these digital capabilities. They rely on their HR uh, units within their departments to be able to provide information for them to them and to run, we rely on those HR units to also run sessions with the employees on the government employee scheme, housing scheme. But if the HR department of that particular unit, I mean, that particular department, the unit is not effective, we also get affected through those, uh, through, uh, through, uh, through, through that um, uh, issue. The, the, the issue around what are we doing with those who who get um, uh, declined by uh, uh, when they apply. There's an ongoing program in relation to uh, counseling and financial management support and et cetera. 
But I think beyond that, the, the activation of a pension-backed um, 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 uh, uh, capability is also just to ensure that um, uh, uh, it's a support that is aimed to bring in uh, credibility to those who the banks are declining because of these particular reasons. The discussions that we're having with the Treasury currently is how do we tap into the, 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 the savings in order to ensure that um, uh, they create an, we create an opportunity through a mechanism for financing that ensures that the employees of government get preference in terms of rates and et cetera. We have not reached any discussions or conclusions, I mean, any conclusions at this stage on this matter, but there's some research and some work that needs to be done around it. Because indeed the money is available and that money is a saving for employees in the public service. I mean, they, for, from the housing scheme, it's their money. So how do we ensure that we use their money to also enable them to be able collectively uh, uh, to qualify for this housing and to get a fair, a fair interest rate in respect to that? Um, uh, the issue around the advisory council, there's a question around the advisory council as well. This is purely just a council that is going to, uh, this is a, a group of people who, are, who will be advising on these matters and just tracking progress. And it's mainly constituted of uh, representatives from the department and representatives from labor. Um, uh, why some are not uh, owning but prefer to rent? Well, uh, Chair, I think some are not owning because they don't have, um, uh, because they, 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 don't, they don't want to buy or because they don't have the capability to buy at a particular point, but it's part of the work that we are doing continuously to encourage people to, uh, uh, to own instead of renting, but uh, also it becomes the people's choices because we cannot really force them, but we must continuously raise awareness and engage with them so that they are taking uh, the benefits, uh, they are taking, uh, 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 they are taking benefit of this particular benefit. There was a question about the increased uptake. Yes, as we are reporting, there is an increased uptake and we're happy with that increased uptake. And we do want to ensure that we continue um, uh, with, with, uh, with encouraging more and more uh, public servants to, 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 to own properties. The, then there was questions about, okay, I've, I, we've addressed the one of employees not receiving allowance. It's a benefit, therefore they have to own to, in order to receive it. And we've spoken about debt uh, counseling and rehab as well. Uh, Kelly, there was a question related to spouses and equal benefit. If married, do you get an equal benefit? I, I, I would like you to maybe to, to clarify that question. I didn't hear you answering it. Uh, uh, there's a proposal to amend legislation for employees to qualify that everyone gets allowance. We will take the, the, the proposal that comes from honorable members and uh, we will take it forward and we will come back in relation to, to this issue. Um, I think, uh, Chairperson, on the question by Honorable Gondwe, I just want to go back and uh, reconcile these numbers and come back. I would prefer to send a response in writing in this because she asked a very specific question. How many, to, how, what's the total number of people who qualify? Out of the total number of the people who qualify, how many are getting? Uh, the, the, how many are tenants, so they're receiving allowances for being tenants, and how many are getting um, 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 the actual housing um, uh, subsidy. We've shared the figures here, but I, I just want to call back and confirm what is the total figure of the employees who qualify, which means those employees between level one and level 10. Uh, I hear my colleague, colleague talking about over 700,000, but I just want to go into the system and confirm the exact numbers of the figure so that we don't give a sense of an assumption uh, in respect to that, to that number. But um, it is in that region. Uh, what, are the, what are we intending to do about those who are not uh, qualifying? Um, uh, again, I think we've addressed this question. Uh, there's ongoing counseling and engagement with those uh, who do not qualify. But on top of that, there, there needs to be interventions that look at how they, they can be guaranteed because the issue is about what guarantees they have a pension. So a pension back guarantee may be useful. There is also the savings that are with treasury that may be a longer process because we must get agreement with treasury on how those savings can be utilized. 
and uh, the engagements that are going on there, there's nothing at the moment that has been finalized yet. I think that I have um, I have tried to summarize everything, Chairperson, except that one question on the spouses, okay. which I would like Kelly to just clarify quickly. Because okay. I'm, yes, thank you. Okay. Running out of okay, time. thank you. Okay, thank you. Yes. Okay, sorry, Chair. Um, in terms of delinking, yes, they are, they get equal amounts. Um, you know, before um, it would be one amount per household, but now if both um, employees are government employees, they get equal amounts. That one thousand four hundred is is enjoyed by both um, husband and wife. Thank you. I see that Honourable Ndoli has raised her hand now at the end of everything. Uh, Honorable Ndoli, remember we must my, lock out my here sincere, and lock into the city. Into the city my, now. Sincere, my sincere apology, Chairperson. Uh, okay. Chair, just just one thing to say: um, the scheme is is it's good news, but somehow, somewhere, it's not benefiting Uma Kumete no Mamkize Aba Cleaner. Uma departments, Emma respect, Bakibele, by Waswai Mane, or Gomakibi, say, or PPP, Angiaz, Mchampe, Bengitsi Banga, I penduli manj, Kebaham, Mchampe, Bangaskebas penduling, Elingi Lang, Wooty. How can Daboba benefit? Because Abafune Tengamus, Emma respect, to loop it. Bonabafuna, Equaswai Mane, and yet. Aba aba kwazi ukwakha umzo oti mamkize wage wasebenza kwa Department of Agriculture for so long eli clean enkos. Honourable Ndoli, uh, honourable members, uh, now we have come to the real end of the meeting. Uh, I apologise for missing the last point that has to be. Uh, shared with the committee, which is this housing scheme for, for public servants. Um, thank you very much for everything. Thank you, honorable members. Thank you, presenters. Thank you, deputy minister, uh, for uh, availing yourself to, to this committee. We appreciate that, dear. I think we must we mustn't be angry when you have not worked well, but when you are doing well, we keep quiet. Thank you very much, Honorable Chikunga. Uh, the meeting now has come to the real end. Thank you very much. The meeting Long is adjourned. Long live the chair. Long live chair. Thank, Thank you very much, yes. police and FPM. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you very much, chair. Thank you. Thank you.
a crucial part for all South Africans. As a portfolio committee of trade, industry, and competition, we're looking at accelerating economic recovery. Uh, we're looking at the inclusive economy reforms to drive inclusive growth. So two out of four priorities of the president is actually the responsibility of the portfolio committee of trade, industry, and 